Hello friends, I'm James and welcome to another Nostalgia Talk bonus! So I just finished watching The Muppet Show on Disney Plus. Yes, I watched every episode of The Muppet Show on Disney Plus. And some of those episodes I hadn't even seen before because they were never available to the public. Seasons 1, 2, th and 3 were released on DVD. Select episodes from seasons 4 and 5 were released on video and I have some of those. But believe it or not, there were quite a few episodes of The Muppet Show that, until recently, I had never watched. Now, The Muppet Show was, at the time, probably the most watched TV show in the world. Both of my parents watched it when they were younger, and they, they, they actually were the ones who pretty much introduced it to me because I had been watching The Muppets for years. One of the first Muppet productions I ever saw was Muppets from Space, which came out just after I was born. I saw Muppet Classic Theater. Uh, but I, I always was a big Muppet fan, but I didn't see The Muppet Show until I was five. And I remember the Time Life Best of the Muppet Show VHS tapes that I was talking about not too long ago. And I remember watching Elton John, Julie Andrews, and Gene Kelly. And since then, I've seen so many other episodes of The Muppet Show, and now I've just finished watching pretty much all of them. I say pretty much because some of you big Muppet fans might already be aware of this, but two episodes of The Muppet Show were not on Disney+, Plus, uh, but I have seen those ones. So I have watched every episode of The Muppet Show. And there's so many great ones, so many great celebrities who came on the show, and so many great skits as well. And so I am going to be once again talking about some of my favorites. I have a list of, again, 10 episodes, but again, this isn't a countdown, I'm not ranking them, I'm just gonna be talking about 10 of my favorite Muppet Show episodes. So without any further ado, it's time to play the music, it's time to light the lights, it's time to talk about the Muppets on the most sensational, inspirational, celebrational, Muppetational Nostalgia Talk. And stay tuned for part two, because I'm gonna be chatting with Brian J. Jones, the author of Jim Henson, The Biography, and we're gonna be chatting about The Muppet Show. Now let's begin. Number one, Madeline Kahn. This actually is my favorite episode, not gonna lie. And the reason is because of a certain skit that's in it. It was Jerry Nelson as Floyd Pepper singing Billy Joel's New York State of Mind. And he did it so beautifully. He did such a great job on it. I love Billy Joel. I listen to a lot of retro music like that. But apart from that, there were a lot of other uh, good moments in that. Uh, I love Madeline Kahn, because uh, she was on Sesame Street very frequently. She did a song with Grover. And in her episode of The Muppet Show, <laughs> Gonzo had the, this was before Camilla, Gonzo had this massive crush on her. And there's one moment where, <laughs> prior to that, he had a crush on Miss Piggy. And so he goes into Miss Piggy's dressing room and, and basically explains, I found someone else. And she says, well, who is she? And he says, oh, she's not like you at all. She's beautiful! <laughs> so there's a good little zinger in there. And it's also the episode that features two other popular Muppet Show skits. One is Kermit the Frog singing Happy Feet, and the other one is the Swedish chef being told off by lobsters. I actually had a copy of the CD uh, Muppet Show Music Mayhem and More, and there was a picture of the Swedish chef and the lobsters, and that CD also had Happy Feet on it. Number two, Dom DeLuise. So, Dom DeLuise was pretty funny in this one. The plot of the episode is everyone in the audience is basically admiring Miss Piggy. That's all they're focusing on, because Scooter paid them to, as they were talking about. And there's one moment in this episode where Miss Piggy was sharing a dressing room with Dom DeLuise. <laughs> and they kind of get into an argument. He's like, well, I'm the guest star on the show and no one seems to notice because the audience is filled with pig fans. And they gave me this tiny little dressing room because the, because your, the big dressing room was full of your fan nail. <laughs> and while he was picking on her, she refers to him as Chubbo. And he's like, well, look who's talking. And she says, are you suggesting that I am a little overweight? And he's like, little? Did I say little? No, 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 I didn't say little. <laughs> there were a couple of other uh, good skits in, in that one. One of them featuring Dom DeLuise was, he was on the planet Coosbane, and there were these creatures around him going, murder dop, and they would pop in and out, murder dop, murder dop. And he would try to, to find them because he was, traveling to the planet Coosbane, but they kept on picking on him. 
And there's one song in this particular episode that's uh, played by the Muppet Show's Jug Band. Uh, and I have it on my phone, actually. It's an older song. Uh, We've been invited to Henrietta's wedding, but she can't tell us where it will be. So there, it was like a wedding where there was a lot of mystery or something. Number three, Harvey Corman. Okay, the only problem that I have with this episode is that one thing they could have done but didn't was have Harvey Corman remaking the dentist sketch from the Carol Burnett show. If you're a Harvey Corman fan, you probably know what skit I'm talking about. Tim Conway making Harvey Corman laugh on purpose. <laughs> that, could, that could have totally worked on The Muppet Show. In this episode, there was really no backstage plot. Most of the action was on stage, and there were a couple of good uh, skits in this one. One of the most popular be being Kermit and Fozzie's comedy act, where Fozzie said to Kermit, When I say the word here, you will rush up to me and say, Good grief, the comedian's a bear! So he does his monologue. Hiya, 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 you're a great audience and it's great to be here. Good grief, the comedian's a bear! No, not that here, the other here! So that, that is one of the funniest Muppet Show skits in my mind. And it also, that episode also included another very lovely skit, which was Robin the Frog, a Jerry Nelson character, singing Halfway Down the Stairs. But the other really funny moment from this one, I'm probably going to be rambling on for most of the video about funny Muppet Show moments, but the other funny moment was um, Harvey Corman, the Muppets dressed up Harvey Corman as a chicken. And so he looks at the camera and he says, how do you get out of this chicken outfit? And for those of you who don't get that joke, chicken outfit could also be another word for this. Uh, this is crazy. <laughs> Pretty well. That's the best way I can describe it. Number four, Carol Burnett. Funny, just after I was talking about Harvey Corman, here's another guest star who was clearly having a horrible time on The Muppet Show. This episode, Carol Burnett was supposed to be on the show, but Gonzo was holding a dance marathon during the show while Carol Burnett was supposed to be on. And so Carol says to Kermit, Kermit, I really don't want to hurt your feelings. Please don't misunderstand me, but this is one of the three worst shows I've ever seen. And Kermit says, well, what were the other two? And Carol says, there are no other two. I was being kind. <laughs> How lovely. <laughs> that was definitely my very favorite Carol Burnett moment ever in anything. And, of course, I've watched The Carol Burnett Show, but as I said, the funniest Carol Burnett skit was Tim Conway and Harvey Korman. I also really liked Carol Burnett singing Leif Garrett's I Was Made For Dancing. Uh, did anybody remember that song? I dun, 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 was made for dancing all, 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 all night long. Little old disco tune. Number five, Gilda Radner. <laughs> I crack up watching this one every time. There were a couple of uh, funny moments in this because Gilda Radner was one of the funniest ladies that there ever was. She was such an amazing performer, and especially in this, she wanted to do operetta, and she says to Kermit, have you got my parrot? Kermit's like, wait, what? And she says, my, my parrot, my, you know, my seven foot tall talking parrot. And he's like, wait, you wanted a seven foot tall talking parrot. So as a, I guess there were some issues. Kermit couldn't read the handwriting. And instead of a parrot, brought Gilda a seven-foot-tall talking carrot. The other uh, half of the episode features uh, Gilda in a Muppet Lab segment where she was assisting Bunsen and Beaker, or guinea pigging, which Gilda wasn't too crazy about that idea. And the experiment involved glue. So Bunsen put some glue right on Gilda's forehead and the glue got stuck to everything in the theater. In fact, during Gilda's final number, she gets stuck to everything. And basically the whole, the whole stage comes apart on her pretty well. It gets, she gets stuck to everything on stage, scenery. Number six, Danny Kaye. Some of you might not know who Danny Kaye is. Well, some of you might not know who a lot of these guests are that I'm talking about, but Danny Kaye was an actor and a singer who appeared on an episode of The Muppet Show. He was actually in a film called Hans Christian Andersen, which I've never seen. And he did a song in that film called Inchworm, which I've heard was one of Jim Henson's favorite songs. And it was performed on The Muppet Show twice. One time by French singer Charles Aznavour, and then Danny Kay sang it with The Muppets. And it was also sung on Sesame Street as well. There are a couple of funny moments in this episode. One of the funniest featured Danny Kay. He was going to be singing the song when we're out together dancing cheek to cheek with Miss Piggy. And he said, well, I saw you sing this song years ago, back when you were thin. Oh. Oops, probably 
probably not the nicest thing in the world to say. <laughs> but there are two other skits from this episode that I really liked. One is a group of Muppets singing the song Age of Aquarius from the musical Hair. I think that's what it was for. I have a version of that song in my phone by the band The Fifth Dimension, but I, I feel like it was in the musical Hair. Uh, leave, leave a comment if I'm right or wrong, just let me know. And the Muppets, as they were singing, their hair gets longer and longer, longer than mine, way longer than mine, to the point where it's over their eyes. I could hear one Muppet saying, hey, I can't see anything. You know where the barber shop is. I also really liked a skit that uh, was in that episode. It was a Muppet singing a song called Jogging. It was a really catchy little song. It wasn't on Disney Plus, when that, uh, with that episode being on Disney Plus, it wasn't on there, it's kind of disappointing. But you can see it right there if you'd like. It's really, really catchy. Number seven, Steve Martin. Steve Martin's one of the funniest men in the world. I love his films. And this episode was kind of different than most episodes of The Muppet Show. Kermit comes on stage and he says, I have some bad news, to which Statler and Waldorf say, Hey! Maybe we're in luck. Yeah, maybe tonight's show has been canceled. Um, tonight's show has been canceled. Have we died and gone to heaven? Basically, they were supposed to be auditioning new acts, but Kermit had kind of forgotten that until coming on stage. And that really irritated Steve Martin. Well, I can understand why. You invite a guest to a show and then he's there and then you realize the show's canceled. Like, that's really annoying. So they audition new acts, and Steve Martin actually does some performances, like making balloon animals, which was one of my very favorites. Uh, juggling, playing the banjo, I'm a rambling guy, was the song he was doing. And the other skit that I really liked uh, that he did in that was playing along the Muppets Jug Band. I really enjoyed watching them perform. Steve Martin is quite the banjo player. There were a lot of other... Uh, skits in that episode as well. Gonzo dancing with a cheese. Oh man, I can't believe I almost forgot about that. But uh, Gonzo wanted to audition uh, an act for Kermit and Kermit's like, I don't want to see your act. And then Scooter comes along and he's like, okay, next up, Gonzalez and Yolanda. Actually, on that note, since I mentioned the Carol Burnett episode, so as I said, in the Steve Martin episode, the show was canceled because they were auditioning new acts. Uh, in the Carol Burnett episode, when Carol Burnett comes in and introduces herself to Pops, the doorman, Pops says, boy, are you in luck? And Carol says, why, has the show been canceled? <laughs> Oddly enough, the Steve Martin episode, the Carol Burnett episode, and the Gilda Radner episode were on one of those uh, Time Life uh, videos that, uh, that I had watched. So that was one of my early introductions to The Muppet Show, and it's funny because on Steve's show, the show's canceled. Carol Burnett was hoping against hope that the show would be canceled. <laughs> Ooh, another act I should mention that was in the Steve Martin episode, Marvin Suggs. All you Muppet fans out there gotta remember Marvin Suggs and his Muppet phone. He would just beat these uh, fuzzy balls and they would sing along, ow, 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 ow. In this one, Marvin Suggs was not beating up little creatures. He had an all-food glee club, and they were singing, Yes, We Have No Bananas Today. I don't know, a very old song, if some of you younger viewers don't know it, but it went something like, Yes, we have no bananas, we have no bananas today. That song was played a lot on The Muppet Show. I, th I guess Jim Henson really liked it. Number eight, Christopher Reeve. Some of you might know of Christopher Reeve best as Superman, the Man of Steel. This was around the time of Superman, Christopher Reeve was a guest. And Miss Piggy was just flaunting over him, basically. Like, uh, she wanted to sing the song Never Before and Never Again, which was in the first Muppet movie. And Rolf was playing the piano, and she deliberately has him get hurt, and has Christopher Reeve come and sing instead, but it was to a different song. But my favorite skit from that episode was with uh, Sam the Eagle. He was disturbed by the fact that there were rats in the theater. And so he's writing a letter to complain. And a group of Muppets started singing a song called Sam Song. It's funny, a lot of the songs from The Muppet Show were previously existing songs. And it's funny that they were doing a song called Sam Song for Sam the Eagle. This actually was a pre-existing song. It was not written for The Muppet Show. So it was Floyd Pepper, Janice, Beauregard the Janitor, 
Rizzo. I think that was Rizzo's first appearance. And my favorite Muppet, Nigel. And it was really satisfying to see Nigel there. Because, again, Nigel is my favorite character from The Muppet Show. He just doesn't get used a lot, which I think is kind of sad. But it was very nice to see him in that. He got to whistle. I was watching that episode, the Christopher Reeve episode, and my dad came in and he said, oh, it's really sad to see him like that. Let me explain. Some time after that episode, Christopher Reeve was in an accident, was paralyzed pretty much from the neck down, and he spent the rest of, he's passed away now, but he spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. And I actually remember Christopher Reeve on Sesame Street when I was really, really, really little. I had never seen The Muppet Show at the time, but I understand what my dad means. Number nine, James Coco. James Coco was an actor on stage and screen. He was a funny guy. He was funny in this episode as well. He did a song called uh, Short People at the very end, which was a Randy Newman song, and I do love Randy Newman. I'm a Disney kid. So for me, Randy Newman, you know, that's uh, You've Got a Friend in Me, uh, Time of Your Life from A Bug's Life, um, the Cars soundtrack. We Belong Together from Toy Story 3, and of course from Monsters, Inc., I Wouldn't Have Nothing If I Didn't Have You. That's Randy Newman, just for some of you Disney lovers out there. My favorite skit from that episode, if you follow me on Instagram, then you probably already know this, but my favorite skit from the James Coco episode was with Kermit and Robin. Robin was afraid to go to sleep because he was afraid of snakes, and Kermit says, well, if you think about it, snakes can be kind of nice. So Robin has this dream sequence of snakes dancing to an upbeat version of the song in a Persian market. <laughs> I also really liked Wayne from Wayne and Wanda singing uh, Catch a Falling Star and Put It in Your Pocket. And he takes that very literally, catches a falling star, puts it in his pocket, and Scooter comes in and he's like, your pants are on fire. <laughs> and James Coco also had a really good cameo in The Muppets Take Manhattan. Number 10, Mac Davis. My dad and his dad liked Mac Davis, and they kind of introduced me to a little bit of Mac Davis. Uh, I knew who Mac Davis was uh, actually watching this episode. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Uh, in this one, my f one of my favorite skits from this involved Mac Davis. He was singing his song, Baby Don't Get Hooked On Me, and he was wearing green flippers and a green shirt and very short black shorts. And it was in an underwater setting. He was sitting on a hook singing to Miss Piggy as a mermaid, don't get hooked on me. And that's probably my favorite Mac Davis song. It was also nice hearing him sing uh, Hard to Be Humble with the Muppets. But the plot of that episode was that Beaker had multiplied in a copying machine that Dr. Bunsen Honeydew had made. And so there were beakers everywhere. And when I say beakers everywhere, I mean copies of the Muppet Beaker everywhere. I also should mention, since I was talking about the underwater setting in the Mac Davis episode, going back to the previous episode I mentioned with James Coco, there was a really good segment in that episode where Kermit and Robin were singing the Beatles song Octopus's Garden, and in that one Miss Piggy was a mermaid as well. And Miss Piggy said to Kermit, I really do like water, which means after we're married, we'll live at your place. There was one episode that featured the great John Denver, in which John Denver and Kermit wanted to take the Muppets camping at the swamp. And Miss Piggy didn't mind until John Denver had told her that there might be snakes and alligators there. And then at that point she was like, I'm not doing this. John Denver did quite a lot with the Muppets. But enough about that. Let's hear from Brian J. Jones. So Brian, thank you so much for agreeing to chat with me t today. Hey, James. Awesome to be here. It's great to have you here. And uh, for the listeners who missed part one and just wanted to see this and missed who my uh, <laughs> and missed my description of who Brian J. Jones is, I'll explain. Brian J. Jones is the author of this book, Jim Henson, The Biography. And this actually chronicalizes Jim Henson's entire life and career, basically, from his biggest influences into going into Sam and Friends. Uh, if you're my age, you wouldn't know what Sam and Friends is, but it was Jim Henson's first show. It was around in the Wait 50s. a minute. Now. If you're my age, you wouldn't know what Sam and Friends is either. So watch it there. <laughs> uh, oops. <laughs> so Sam and Friends was Jim Henson's first show, and then going into that – to uh, Ed Sullivan's show, and then Sesame Street, and The Muppet Show, which is, of course, what we're here to talk about now, because The Muppet Show, if, uh, if, if for those of you who haven't seen my video with Joe Hennis and Ryan Rowe, The Muppet Show is now streaming on Disney+. Plus. Woo! Yay, finally! Yeah, it's about time. Have you been watching it on Disney+. Plus? 
I have been watching it in, in fits and starts. Um, I actually just went ahead and started with season four because I have the first three seasons on DVD. So I just started playing season four kind of at random um, because it's good, you know, because we hadn't had that one for so long. So, yeah. Well, I had only seen a few, I had the Time Life videos and, I those um, too. and only a few episodes of seasons four and five were uh, on those. But since the episodes were put in out of order, I found the openings really confusing. Like right. the, first, the first three episodes I saw were Elton John and Julie Andrews, which were both in season two. And then the third episode that was on that first tape was Gene Kelly, which was in season five. So five. I, I very highly remember Scooter coming into the first two episodes. Elton John, 15 seconds, the curtain. And same with Julie Andrews. And then I see Pops the Doorman. And I'm five years old watching this. And I was like, <laughs> what? You have that? a problem with uh, consistency here. Yeah. Well, I, 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 nobody really explained to me at the time that. Uh, and for one thing, nobody. And when I saw season one for the first time, it was on the season one DVD. I think I was like seven, I believe. And the intro for that confused me. Because I was used to the um, the one for the one after where they're in the arches singing and then oh they, right yeah it's been, and then yeah, they, really... yeah and, and then they plus cut... season one is just so different than all the rest of them anyway too it just feels different right but the most starstruck I ever was when watching those early episodes was when Kermit introduced uh, it's the Muppet Show featuring Connie Stevens and Ernie and Bert that was where I went the most crazy because it all started with Sesame Street for me as a Muppet right. fan right. well you know and what I always tell people it it's so hard for people to believe now because we're so familiar with these characters, but when the Muppet show debuted, nobody knew who these characters were. Mm. You know I mean? It's like, I remember reading about it cause I'm way older than you are, James. <laughs> I remember reading about it in TV guide though, when the Muppet show came out, it used to be in, in the TV guide, there would be these little boxes that said special. And it was a little, it was like a little, like a shorter write up on the episode that was coming. And it was explaining like, it's the Muppet show and it's a whole new series of Muppets. And they were going down the names and I'm like, I don't know who any of these are. Mm. Uh, Kermit, I know. Okay, I, oh, I've never heard of Fozzie Bear, Fuzzy Bear, Fizzy Bear. Like, you know, it's like we're trying to figure out this. So it's so weird to realize that, like, you know, when I first tuned in, I had no idea who any of these, who any of these Muppets were. Mm. And that's why it was actually really smart for Jim Henson in that episode to bring in Ernie and Bert. Um, I, think the way I, I think the way I put it in the book was like it let viewers know they were at least looking in the right house, <laughs> even if they didn't recognize the interior. You know, it's like, so we at least give us something from, oh, okay, Ernie and Bert, I know Ernie and Bert. So like we've got something grounding us here apart from just Kermit. But it was, you know, it was actually really smart to get them in there early and kind of establish like, you know, the home base, here's home base. Because uh, again, it is very weird to realize that like when the first time Fozzie comes out, and especially in those early episodes, Piggy's really nowhere to be found. Mm. Like we'd never seen any of these characters before. It was all really unfamiliar, which again is really weird to think about. Mm. Well, speaking of Piggy, I, I have a surprise and I've been saving it up just for this. So the other day I went to this uh, thrift store in Dartmouth called Reform. It's a very small thrift store. And it was shown on Instagram that they were having a little, they were trying to get rid of some old, old stuff, uh, inclu including a Miss Piggy puppet. So I went to reform and there it was. And uh, it's, it's, this is one of those uh, puppets that are made out of plastic. Yeah. Here she is. Oh, wow. That's a great one. Hello. Holy hello, cow. All, hello, all you nostalgia lovers out there. If you're not listening to the show, I'll break your ribs. You know, I never, I never had um, any of the Muppet Show puppets when they came out. I did have um, when I was in, ugh, geez, uh, you know, I might have been five or six. I had Ernie, and my brother had Bert because my brother always had to be the straight man. I had to have Ernie, uh, and those were the only ones I had. But they were very rubbery like that, and Bert's mouth in particular was really hard to move. My father had a uh, count puppet that was pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that, that's a beautiful puppet, actually. They yeah. did a really nice job with it. I showed it to a couple of past guests who have had Muppet connections that have been on Nostalgia Talk. Uh, Ivy Austin jokes, oh, you two make a beautiful couple. <laughs> uh, it's pretty, pretty dead on Miss Piggy there, too, my friend. Yeah, my Aunt Deb uh, actually had this. And as a matter of fact, speaking of my Aunt Deb, she came up with the name Nostalgia Talk Bonus. I can't believe oh, no that kidding. I have never mentioned that. Basically, I was working on one. Bravo, Aunt Deb. And, she lives up in uh, New Brunswick, uh, Fredericton. And um, I said, oh, I'm working on a little something special for Nostalgia Talk, but it's not an interview. She's like, oh, a little bonus. And I was like, oh, that's a good name for it. So that's that's what I ended up going with. 
a little um, bonus. And Lewis Henry Mitchell, who's, uh, I don't know if you'd know who that is, but he's creative director of character design at Sesame Street. And he came on here last month and um, he, I showed him this and he said, wow, that is really spot on. <laughs> the, uh, but the only thing is that Miss Piggy could be a little thin. Excuse yeah, me. Hi! <laughs> you said the mouth is like really firm in there, huh? Yeah. Well, the big issue that I have with this is that because it's, this is like from the seventies, I believe. And because it's so old, what I have to do. So old. So old. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I have to wear a glove because it, 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 the dust gets on my hand. So I wear a glove when I'm moving the mouth. And it's so funny that I mentioned uh, Miss Piggy being thin. That is the second time that that has come up on this episode because I was talking about the Danny Kay show where Danny Kay wanted to sing when we're out together dancing cheek to cheek with Miss Piggy. And she says, why do you want to sing it with me? And he said, well, I heard you singing this song many, many years ago. She's like, really? And he's like, yes, <laughs> back when you were thin. And he just realizes <laughs> what he said. Oh, boy. Oh, man. Do you have any favorite episodes of The Muppet Show? I love, so you and I talked a little bit about your 10 favorite. I love the Gilda Radner episode. That's one of my oh, favorites. Yeah. Uh, Steve Martin, one of my favorites. Elton John. I love the Brooke Shields episode because I'm a huge Alice in Wonderland fan. Oh, cool. uh, and that one is not in the rotation right now. One of the, yeah, I think it's I, like one of only two that isn't in there right now. But. Yeah, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, earlier, but I have, I have seen that one. And the other one that is cut with a guest who shall remain nameless. Yes, whose just, name we shall not speak. Yeah, um, just to be safe. And then, of course, I love the stars of Star Wars. That's one of my, one of my favorites, the big crossover mm -hmm. episode. Uh, so those are some of the Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper was a, just one that was surprisingly awesome, especially when like, you know, back in the day when you were like, Alice Cooper, how are they going to pull this off? And he just crushes it on there. Uh, so those are those are some that kind of rise to the top for me. Usually my favorite episode is whatever I'm watching at the moment. Tends to be. OK, yeah, I, I get that. Um, yeah, the Alice Cooper episode, my dad was big into Alice Cooper. My dad likes a lot of. Uh, 70s 80s metal rock like alice cooper and kiss yeah. and rat and uh, see i wasn't into alice movie. cooper at all in fact i thought he was going to be like completely scary and weird and you know, alice, alice cooper was like on a part with like kiss or something and so when i found out i was like alice cooper and he's just he's great on there and it's, it's funny he's from um he's from my wife's hometown I mean, oh I, wow I, I haven't met him but it's like he's huge like in phoenix they just love him and he has like bar you know he has a bar called cooperstown down there where they play <laughs> and he's just like and he's he's really funny and he's very personal so like you know the the alice cooper you get on the muppet show is is the actual alice cooper which is actually very cool cool mm. Well, when my father showed me the uh, Alice Cooper episode, I not to sound sexist, but I actually was very confused by the name. Yeah, a guy much. named Alice. Yeah. Yeah, and of course like they made Carol a... Spinney. Yeah, well, it's it's so weird, like with for somebody like uh, Carol Spinney, because I remember when um, Carol Spinney passed away, and I told a friend of mine, I'm my not all of my friends are big Muppet fans like me. In fact. I'm pretty like it, it, in my uh, group of friends from film school, I'm pretty much the only one who has a big passion for showbiz for kids. Mm. Like everything that we've written, not like most of their, uh, I'm not trying to criticize my film school. And <laughs> I think they're, look, I think they're very talented and they're great writers. None of my scripts involved cursing and some of theirs had a lot of cursing. Oh, very good. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, with, um, uh, now I actually did forget what I was going to say about Alice oh, Cooper. They, 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 probably Carol Spinney. I have an yeah, uncle named yes. Carol. I have an uncle named Carol. So like hearing Carol Spinney, I wasn't. I did not imagine think it was a woman. Yeah, and so like so like so many people have uh, said to me, Big Bird's played by a woman. Oscar's a woman? played yeah. by a woman, and I'm like, no, no, two L's. <laughs> right. Yeah. That was actually the very first ever Nostalgia Talk bonus video that I did. It was a tribute to Carol Spinney. And I used clips of uh, some some people who have come on the show have brought him up. So I collated clips of Kevin Carlson, who is an L.A. Muppet performer, uh, Sesame Street book illustrator Joe Matthew, who, by the way, loved your book. Oh, good. I'm always glad to hear. Yeah. That. And Ivy Austin, they were uh, talking about Carol Spinney. So I collated them together and I posted that on his birthday, on what would have been his birthday. Did you get to know Carol when you were doing the book? I didn't get to talk to Carol. Um, Carol was working on his own memoirs at the time. And so I think he was keeping all the good stuff for himself. Not that what I got was not the good stuff. Cause I got uh, everything I got from yeah. him is in his earlier book. And there's also stuff in the archives. 
uh, on him. But no, I didn't. I didn't actually get Carol because, like I said, he was he was preparing his his book, so I think he was like, well, I'm not going to talk to him and give all my good stuff up. So I didn't get him. <laughs> oh man. Well, and and of course they have that documentary about him out now. Have you seen that? I have. That came out well after the book came out, so I mm. didn't get to incorporate that either. But 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 again, you know, it was fine. I mean, Carol's book is was great, and for what I needed, I mean, the quotes in there were great. I love the Muppets West. I mean, Jim always called them Muppets West, which I love. <laughs> and I think he even mentioned that in in his uh, is I can't think what they, yeah, the book is called right now. It's the Me Big Bird and Oscar the Grouse, something like that. Wisdom of Big Bird. Wisdom of Big Bird. There's yeah yeah. So the, most of the quotes I got from him, I pulled out of that book. Mm. So I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that out of the episodes of The Muppet Show that you've seen on Disney+, Plus, I'm just going to guess that the Star Wars one has been your favorite. I haven't watched that one yet, but that was like, oh. but, that, but that's one like I had that on the Time Life one anyway. So I've, I, okay, I've watched yeah. that one plenty. The ones I've watched, I've watched, oh my God, I can't remember what they are now. I watched the first two from season four already and I was commenting on them on Twitter and somebody was like, geez, I get the impression you haven't seen these until just now. And I'm like, you would, you would be right. And people are saying, well, geez, we thought you researching the book would have had like, you know, had, they would have given them all to you. And it's not I that could, easy. Well, you know, I mean, it's like, I'm sure they have all those in the archives and somebody like Craig Shemin, who like, just like, just, you know, dives for that kind of stuff and has all that stuff. He probably would have given them to me had I asked, but, you know, it's like I had the first three seasons. I'd watched those. I had watched the show growing up. I mean, I was familiar with the conceits and everything else. So it wasn't one of those where I'm like, I got to sit down and watch all 126 or I'm just not going to get it. Uh, okay. The main thing I did was I did go back and I watched quite a bit of season one and then quite a bit of season two because you had that change in writers. Right. In the head writer, you had Jerry Joel coming in. Second. So I really wanted to make sure I understood the difference in you know, tone and pace and rhythm in season one versus season two. Um, so there it was really more important that I went back and watched those. It, I, you know, it was great to be able to go and watch the Muppet show and call it work and watch Sesame Street and call it work. Um, but I didn't need to have all, you know, 120 in front of me to be like, well, I just don't think I can do the Muppet show justice unless I watch all 120 of them again. That was a chapter I actually really sweat uh, when I was writing it, because it's such an important part of Jim's story. And, you know, it's like, you know, when you're writing about George Lucas, you don't want to get Star Wars wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I'm writing about Jim Henson, I'm like, I really got to be sure that I do this right. And, um, and I tend, you know, I always have people go like, you know, like when you held up the book, and some people always go like, oh, and it's told in chronological order. And I'm like, I don't know how you would write biography and anything but chronological I mean I'm not smart enough to do it if you are but but Jim's but Jim's one of these guys that like everything in his life is causal like I mean you you can really the only way to tell his story is chronological because what he learns here shapes what he does next and influences mm. what he does next and the lessons he learns and so on so anyway the point of that is when I got to the Muppet Show chapter I'm like how do I start this and um you know, how do you, how do I get in all these really great stories that I've got from people? So, so rather than jump around in that chapter or, or try to, um, you know, try to give you every episode or give, you know, cover all five seasons. It was one of those where I, I started you off a little smaller by just showing like, here's the way a typical week worked. Like and a production week? Like a production week. So I talk okay. about like, you know, the week. So then when I say, you know, and then this is the day they did the songs, then I could spend some time talking about songs and Jim's idea of song and what kind of music you like. I mean, it lets you cover a lot of stuff within that framework. But that was that was actually a really hard chapter because I was like, I have to be sure I tell this in a way that like doesn't disappoint people when they get to it. Well, you kept it very interesting, I will say. Well, I mean, it's it's hard to... Jim Henson is hard to not make interesting. You right, can tell his, exactly. You can tell his story uh, badly, but I don't know that you can tell it uninterestingly. Um, and, you know, there's just, and there's just, and the hardest part with his story is there's just so much good stuff that you just, you can't possibly get it all in. Mm. Um, and, you know, with The Muppet Show, and you've got great books that have been written on The Muppet. One of my favorite books, one of the reasons I wanted to write the Jim Henson biographies, because I love Of Muppets and Men. I just oh, love that yeah. book. And I had actually uh, emailed with um, the, well, who's the author of that? Is it Christopher, Christopher Finch. Christopher Finch, not Lynch. I had actually emailed Close. Christopher a couple times. Oh God, my brain is so rotten, rotten right now. It's a, a year in lockdown, do that to you. Um, and I had actually, we had actually corresponded a little bit back and forth, which was really cool to me because I got to tell him how important that book was to me. Because I just, I absolutely love that book. I used to check it out of the library all the time and read it. Oh, and I actually nice. found a beautiful copy of it on eBay for like 20 bucks. It's got the, you know, the dust jacket. Like people always talk about, oh, they can never find that book. Man. I must, I mean, 
I must have hit it before anybody cared that much, but I have a gorgeous copy of that book. But anyway, I'm meandering, but the whole point was like, I really wanted to be sure I got that chapter right. And, you know, Christopher had told it very, had told the story very well. And again, there was a whole lot there. And I'm like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to tell the story that Chris told, and I don't want to tell it the way he told it. But there's so much stuff in there that I hope everyone, you know, every once in a while, there might be a nugget. You're like, I think I remember reading that in his book, but I'm hoping there's, I'm hoping I told my story well enough that you don't recognize some of those when you hit them at times. Because I didn't want people to be like, eh, I could just read of Muppets and Man and get this chapter in here. Well, I mean, I, 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 Basically, I have been referred to by so many people at Muppets as a walking encyclopedia of Muppets. That's what they call me. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so, you know, reading reading books like uh, Sesame Street Unpaved, Jim Henson, The Works, and this one, of course. So, of course, some things that are in here I know already. No offense. But it was kind of interesting to read some new information in here, too. Like uh, Tales of – I know that this isn't Muppet Show related, but Tales of the Tinker Dee. I never would have, I mean, I probably would have assumed it, but I never would have figured that the ogre was just Jim Henson's legs covered in (laughs) dirt. Right. Well, I mean, uh, what I love is, is the sixties. I think the sixties is such a cool period in his life because it's so different Mm. and it's because he doesn't know what he wants to do yet. I mean, it's like, you know, again, when you're looking backwards, like we know who Jim Henson is. If I tell you, tell me who Jim Henson is, you're like, he's a Muppet guy. And, uh, but in the 60s, oh, he's not just Jim, a Muppet guy. He's but, the Muppet guy. Right. But in the 60s, Jim Henson doesn't know that. I mean, and he's so he's, you know, the Muppets are one of the things he does. But that's the period where he's doing Cyclia and where he's doing Timepiece and where he's doing Youth 68. And, you know, he's doing so many interesting, weird, random things. Trying And the Muppets are paying the bills. But, mm. you know, he, he's doing so many other different things and playing with the, the format on TV and playing with the tech and just, you know, doesn't 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 really have him doesn't have himself locked down really until Sesame Street comes along and Sesame Street's like yeah. the, the big pivot like the point that changes everything and in fact there's that quote from Jerry Jewell he says something like you know he didn't he, he was a little skeptical because he didn't want to be you know pigeonholed as the children's puppeteer and that there was a mm, very real true. chance of that happening to him with that if when he if he took Sesame Street you know because he again he had just come off doing youth 68 and the cube uh, and then here comes Sesame Street a couple of months later. So, you know, he's got so many different things going on. I love that period in his life. But it's, again, because even Jim Henson doesn't know what Jim Henson is at that point. Right. Well, since you were talking about Jim's uh, life in the 60s, there is actually a picture in this book that I wanted to share. Uh, since we've been since we're discussing the Muppet show, there's a, actually there's a lot of really good pictures in here. Here's uh, here's one that I'll share with uh, with you guys. It's uh, Jim Henson, and the guy with the glasses is Frank Oz before he had a mustache and was bald. And before he was bald, believe it or not, Frank had hair. Uh, I'm sorry, Frank, if you're listening. Yeah, I love um, that picture, though. Yeah, that's uh, basically Rolf. Uh, some of you guys might not be aware of this, but Rolf, uh, the piano playing dog, first started out in a dog food commercial. And it went from a dog food, food commercial to here he is as a regular on the Jimmy Dean show. So he was really the first Muppet to gain popularity. Kermit was before Rolf, but right. at this point when the Muppets were appearing on the Jimmy Dean show and Rolf was on basically every week, that's when he started to get more recognition. Right. Yeah. When I talk about Jim, I always ask the crowd, I'm like, okay, everybody, who, who was the first really famous, like nationally known Muppet? Everyone's like Kermit, you know, everyone's just shouting stuff out and it's usually all Muppet show era Muppets. And I have mm-hmm. a slide that goes up and the picture of Rolf just slowly <laughs> crawls up the screen as they're saying it. And people are like, you know, wow, Rolf, What's so, so, you know, we, you, and, you and I are joking about the age difference here. When I was doing this project, when I started, this, like when I was a kid, my mom used to always go, you know, when, when the first episodes of The Muppet Show came out, I remember my mom saying, uh, oh yeah, Rolf, I used to watch Rolf on the Jimmy Dean show in the 60s. And I'm like, no, you didn't, mom. No, you didn't. There were no Muppets in the old days. That uh, almost reminds me of a conversation that I had with Chris Surf. Do you know who uh, that is? Mm-hmm, yeah. So Chris Surf came on here and he he's he wrote so many great parodies for Sesame Street. And I have a copy of the Born to Add album that Sesame Street did that featured uh, a bunch of songs that he had yeah. written and sung on, including Born to Add. And I got that as an eight year old and my with my dad's background in old school music that's older than most of what I listen to, like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and 98 Degrees, Britney Spears, New Kids on the Block, Christina Aguilera. Um 
base. So basically, um, my dad said, you know, it's actually called born to run. And I'm, I'm eight years old. I'm like, no, it's not. What did I know? <laughs> exactly. Well, that's the way I would. Just my mom's talking about watching Rolf. I'm like, you have to have that wrong, mom. You have to, there was no such thing as Rolf back then. Of course she was right. Um, and then I remember later she was telling me that she used to watch it with my grandmother back in the, oh, this, wow. before my time. They used to watch it. And my grandmother apparently was fascinated by Rolf, could not figure out how he worked and uh, finally decided that he had to be a guy in a costume. She thought there was no way, you know, it didn't even occur to her that was a puppet. She, she could not figure Rolf out. Well, when I was a kid watching, I, I also watched a lot of Disney, as you can see by my shirt and by my Steamboat Willie poster right there. Nice. Um, like, I could always tell from watching these things, no human has black lines around it. No human talks like this. Right. Well, she, so, I mean, I think maybe yeah. she thought it was somebody in a costume, but I mean, mm. she just, she could not figure that out. Mm. Especially found... because, I mean, Rolf, you know, Rolf's got hands. I mean, they're not people, you know, it's people hands inside the ghost, but they, mm -hmm. they like work like real hands. So you're like, well, that can't be a puppet because if, if, if you don't have the idea of how a live hand puppet works, mm. it just doesn't occur to you. I don't know. Anyway, I just love that story that my grandmother finally just gave up. She's like, it's a guy in a costume. <laughs> I found the uh, picture that I was searching for, by the way. So, this was uh, basically before even Sesame Street, Jim Henson always wanted to do something like The Muppet Show before it was known as The Muppet Show. So this would have been in the late 60s, just before Sesame Street. I think it's, 60, it's 1965, I think is what that one's from. And it doesn't say. It doesn't but, say, but I think that's 65. But this is the original poster that Jim Henson had made to promote, I want to do this Muppet Show. It's actually and, the cover of his pitch. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, wow. Yeah, it's the cover of his pitch. And if you, if you hold it, hold the bottom up to the camera and show it, you can see there's a very old version of Kermit on there. See, that's like the first version of Kermit. And that address over there is like their very old, ad, their, you know, their old company address there in New York. There's their old phone number. In fact, you dial it, the number doesn't work. But that's um, nice. but that's, so that's Jim's original pitch. Uh, with the old Kermit on there, um, you know, and that's what I love about the Muppet Show is it, it's a real study in stick to itiveness. I mean, Jim, you know, Jim knew that was going to work. So there, so there you go. There's that pitch from 1965, 10, 11 years before the Muppet Show ever makes it on TV. Jim's like confident that this is going to work. He's done enough variety shows. He's pretty sure the Muppets can hold their own. Um, but you know, where we get to the stick to itiveness and why I really admire Jim in this is, you know, he's got three times essentially that he's given the opportunity to make a pilot and three times it tanks, um, you know, it's, and he just doesn't stop, you know, so you've got the first one he does, you know, Michael Eisner, green lights one. And so he, you know, he, he does the Valentine's day special. Oh yeah. Interesting, but you know, nobody goes for it. Mm -hmm. So then, but they give him another one. So Muppet show sex and violence starting to look a little more familiar. Some characters are recognized still. Not enough that anyone's going to make him an offer. Makes that great Muppet pitch reel. That's oh, got that yeah. really fantastic last, you know, two minutes with the the amped up Muppet salesman that Jim just does so well. Leo shows that to the CBS, the suits at CBS, and they turn him down. Oh, I mean, most people and most people would finally say like, you know what? Forget it, it's just Ooh. not going to work. Jim knows that's going to work and manages to find somebody who gets it, and that turns out to be uh, Lou Grade over in over in London who gets it, who's kind of an old school showman. Um, the way Jim sort of is and really gets it. And, but, you know, the catch is, well, you got to come over here and I've got L Street Studios lying fallow. So uh, come over here. And Jim, who doesn't even really discuss it with Jane, is like, absolutely, we'll come over to London. Yeah, Jim, yeah, Jim, <laughs> Jim didn't care with that. Like, he would, he, like, he never would, the way that Dave Goals describes him is he would never, you know, do something that he wouldn't ask anyone else to do. Right. And and I love, I mean, and Oz telling me the story about how they were at SNL and, you know, just real suffering and silence with those Land of Gorge sketches. But he's, you know, he's still just like, you know, just lights up remembering Jim coming up to him after they landed that deal and, you know, essentially like grabbing him by the car. And he's just like, we just got greenlit for the Muppets, you know, so excited. And we just, you know, we just got 20, you know, 13 episodes or 26 episodes. It was so excited about it. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, again, by the way, pack your bags. We're going to London. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, I just would like to clarify something that uh, that you were just talking about with the Muppet Show pilots. So a lot of people <coughs> recognize the Muppets as very family friendly characters. And as Brian had said, one of the first Muppet Show pilots was called Sex and Violence. I'm going to be totally clear. Some of you younger listeners out there, 
The show had nothing to do with sex and violence. Basically, right. what it was was because Jim became popular and the name Muppet became popular on Sesame Street, Sesame Street was a preschool show. Jim Henson did not create Sesame Street. It was created by Joan Gans Cooney and Lloyd Morissette. John Stone, who was the first uh, head writer and executive producer of Sesame Street, um, he hired Jim to come on because he knew him. And he thought maybe this could work with, with puppets, you know, to entertain the kids. But that wasn't what Jim wanted to do with his career. So the Muppet Show pilot was called Sex and Violence because it was saying you can have adult content on TV with puppets without sex and violence. So the opening is even, ladies and gentlemen, presenting the end of sex and violence on television. And I remember wanting to watch that, and my mom actually had to watch it first. <laughs> right. And the, yeah, and then Crazy Harry blowing it up. It was funny because oh, um, uh, when I was talking with Cheryl Henson about it, she goes, well, wasn't, you know, I mean, they were making fun of, like, somebody had misheard sax and violins. I'm like, nope, that's actually not what the joke was. <laughs> I was like, that was that was Emily Latella, but yeah, she was very funny. She's like, it was it was like a sax and violin joke, wasn't it? No, nope, it wasn't sax and violin. But they did do a song on the early Muppet shows, "Sax and Violence," which was um, right. uh, Zeus, as you can see right my display right there. Uh, let me bring that out. So I was in a club at school in grade eight, and uh, at, when it was uh, I was in grade yeah I was in grade eight, so it was my last year of junior high, and uh, at the clubs and they gave everyone gifts and this was my gift no one knew who this character was except me <laughs> they were right. like hey, they were like for james a muppet and i was like oh <laughs> zoot to be exact yay yeah and um for the sex and violence pilot so if any of you listeners want to check it out first of all again it's not inappropriate i swear to god it's not inappropriate it's not but it is totally different from the original Muppet show because Jim wanted to create a new character uh, as the host named Nigel. And I told Joe and Ryan this, Nigel is my favorite Muppet franchise character. I, I refer to the Muppet show, Muppets Tonight, stuff like that as the Muppets franchise. Ah. Uh, and Nigel is my favorite because, you know, it, I just like that. He's basically Jim Henson's normal voice and his normal normal personality. Very, very chill, like kind of Harry, no more explosions. And this here is Floyd. He's kind of a resident hip musician, but that didn't work uh, because they thought he was just too wimpy, I guess. I disagree. It's, yeah, it's a very milk toast character. I mean, it's interesting. You you watch those first two pilots, and you know, Kermit is not at the center of them. Mm. Um, you know, it's like Jim's almost I don't I don't know that he's hedging his bets. I don't know if partly he was feeling stung from um, you know, when, when uh, he was accused of commercializing Sesame Street by using Kermit mm. in, um, what was it? Hey, Cinderella, I think. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, so I don't know if he was like, well, we can't use Kermit because he's he's too affiliated with Sesame Street at this point. I don't want to run that trap again. So he, uh, you know, it takes good. At one point, John Stone says something like, well, I think Jim, you know, didn't want to be so busy performing so he didn't use kermit but he's still performing the lead character so i'm right. not sure that 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 was actually what was going on I, th I think partly maybe he was i think he was a little worried about again being stung again for using kermit uh you know and commercializing the sesame street character so i think he was trying to find other characters and just finally just realized it just doesn't work i mean kermit's 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 clearly the one you have to use but those first two are really interesting experiments and again, them trying to figure out the format and figure out the host. And, you know, it, it, I, I mm. talk in, in the bio a little bit about it's so interesting to me, especially in sex and violence. Like where does or, or I'm sorry, let me even go back to, to the Valentine special. Like where does this take place? It's, oh, it, yeah. it looks like a set. But is it supposed to be like a conservatory? I, you know, it's like we don't, we don't actually we don't have a feel for where this is taking place. And then even in sex and violence, it's like. We're in the control room. I get that, but that's what's... hardly even a control room. It just looks like but a it, lounge. Yeah, and it's like, but what are they controlling? We don't have any sense that it's necessarily a TV station. So it's like, I think they were still trying to figure out that sense of place again that we finally hit again perfectly in the Muppet Show, where it's like it's in a theater. What's going on backstage is you know there, and then we have the show up. For, I mean, it's the perfect format for the Muppets actually. But you watch those earlier, you know, takes on it, and. Uh, they can't figure out the place. They can't figure out their sense of place. They can't figure out who's at the center of it, who's the host. It, it feels very convoluted. It feels very messy mm. when you watch those first two. Mm. Do you feel that – so the, the first head writer of The Muppet Show was Jack Burns. And who for, for those of you who don't know, let me explain who Jack Burns is. Jack Burns was a comedian who was known for 
being a part of the duo Burns and Schreiber. And what's really cool about that first season is that his comedy partner, Avery Schreiber, both of them are no longer with us, but Avery Schreiber was an early guest on The Muppet Show. And basically, Jack Burns, like his material, whether it's alone or with Schreiber, is really based on running gags. And if you go back and watch the Rita Moreno episode, there's a prime example of running gags, the Candace Bergen episode, um, just a whole bunch of the early episodes of The Muppet Show were based around constant jokes. And then when Jerry Jewell stepped in, the backstage plots seemed a little bit more consistent. Do you think that's when The Muppet Show really started to take off? Yeah, I do. And and that's exactly, that's a huge part of it right there. I mean, Jack Burns was very... Um, Vignetti. <laughs> I mean, he, he liked, he liked, you know, at the dance is a perfect example. That's a Jack oh, yeah. Burns type setup. Uh, and that's, you know, one joke after another. And Jerry Jewell said, we're getting rid of that. There's no, we're not advancing anybody. There's no sense of character there. I mean, it's, that's mm-hmm. essentially a, a skit from laugh in oh, yeah, uh, at the time, much. you know, so, you know, it, it, so, so you've got two completely different sensibilities right there. And once you get Jerry in there, Jerry's the one who's like, you know, veterinarian's hospital. This is where we're going to really develop Rolf a little bit more as a character. We're going to, you know, get a feel for the band and, and sketches are going to be driven by character, not the joke, uh, which again is a fundamental difference, is a fundamental difference in the way Jerry works versus the way Jack works, but it's also a fundamental difference of why the Muppets work uh, there as opposed to other places. I, you know, I when we talk about things like Muppets Tonight, for example, or the Muppets, the one on uh, that was just recently on in what was it, 2015? Which yeah. I've been rewatching, and is actually on. It, I'm, I'm actually really liking it now. Yeah, I but liked it too when it aired. But, but it's like the the setup is secondary to the character. I mean, mm-hmm. it clearly mattered because they figured it out finally with the Muppet Show setup versus those earlier two. But it's like the characters should drive the conceit, not the other way around. So that's why again, Jerry Joel gets in and says, "Forget at the dance. We we don't need to just be sitting here and throwing out zingers. That's not mm-hmm. doing anything for anybody. It's three minutes wasted." Um, yeah. But that was but that was Jack's mentality, and Jack's very funny. Oh, um, very much, yeah. And you know, and there's a reason. Like Jim kept working with him. It wasn't like Jim's like you're you're an untalented hack. I mean, Jim didn't think that at all. Jim Jim's would never like, say that to anybody. Right, but Jim's like it's just it's not working. Jerry understands our rhythms. I mean, he'd been working with Jerry since the '60s. Jerry got it. Jerry understood the Muppets. He understood the character. He understood the rhythm. And rhythm is really kind of what matters. Watch those season one episodes versus those season twos, and there is a real difference in rhythm uh, when you see them. They move like you were saying. I mean. What's happening backstage actually advances what's happening front stage. Mm-hmm. Um, we're a little more character driven. We've got we've got a a through line, not just a series, a through line that's not a series of just like running gags. Mm. Kind of like in in an episode that I uh, was talking about, the James Coco episode, where because um, James Coco is a bit of a stage actor. I think he did he do any Broadway shows? I'm not certain about that, I'm not, but I'm not sure. But he seemed like he had some Broadway experience when he was on The Muppet Show because Kermit was like, closing numbers are big extravaganzas. And James Coco was like, no, 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 they're small. And so when he came on, he did something that was literally small, doing the Randy Newman song, Short People. <laughs> right. And also with, with a difference between season one and season two, um, that uh, season one, they had Muppet Labs with Dr. Bunsen Honeydew by himself. and. Right. Uh, of course, that was, I think, the most famous one to come out of that was, of course, the Gorilla Detector skit. So that- <laughs> famous enough that there's the toy based on it, even. Yeah. yeah, but Muppet Labs, I think, really started to take off. Well, every skit for the Muppet Show that is popular now really started to take off in season two, because in season two, that's when they brought in the one of the most beloved Muppets that there is, in fact, Every time I, re- I reference Bunsen and Beaker, everyone only knows of Beaker, but season two is the debut of Beaker. Right. And that who, kind who, of- Who Richard Hunt does apparently by inhaling is the way he gets that high squeak, which I just still- Yeah, can't. like I, I noticed that in some of Beaker's early, like let's jump forward to the Zero Mostel episode, for example, which was Beaker's first ever appearance. And it was, and he just kind of comes in like- and Buns is like, come on in, Beaker, come on in. It doesn't really introduce him. It's just like, this is, hey, like, come on in, Beaker. So we've established who this character is. What's he doing? 
And so I think the I think the experiment was magnetic carrots. That's one of my very favorite Muppet Lab skits. <laughs> Forget about the gorilla detector. <laughs> um, when I remember I remember Dave Goals talking about how people would tell him, "Oh, I, Bunsen's my favorite character," and Dave was like, "Really?" He's like, "Bunsen is me making fun of like every prof- boring professor I had in college." <laughs> Please don't tell me you love that. But <laughs> yeah. And uh, with, and I I actually can hear a little bit of Richard inhaling now because the second that the magnetic carrots go on to the um onto i think it was like a rack or something beakers nectar and he goes kind of like that and yep. and throughout most of beaker's appearances early early appearances he's silent other than the inhaling and then i think by season three it was oh, me, 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 me. yeah i finally forget and like i can't even hit that register half the time i mean richard hunt's pretty pretty incredible and, and richard hunt's natural voice is not terribly high you can just hit that register. And I think partly, you know, that inhaling does help you get to that. Right. I can't do it, but I mean, it helps you get up there, but yeah. such a, such a great character. I mean, I, I love Frank Oz describing Richard Hunt as force of nature is just the absolute perfect description for Richard. Mm. It's funny. I was just talking to Marty Robinson, also known as Snuffleupagus, Telly monster, slimy the worm. And um, he, I asked him, do you have any favorite Richard Hunt stories? And he's like, I love Richard. His, anytime he walked into a room, you could just feel it because his characters were so crazy. Yeah. But I would like to go back to something you were saying uh, before, since I brought up uh, the uh, distressed uh, assistant and the very calm lecturer with what you were saying, <laughs> that type of uh, a shtick with what you were saying about Kermit being deemed too commercial because of like, Hey, Cinderella and Sesame street. He actually was dropped from Sesame street for its second season because of that and was replaced by, Herbert Birdsfoot. Herbert Birdsfoot yeah. yeah, I actually really like that character. Um, I, I did too. And again, you know, I mean, with the, I'm, I'm Sesame Street generation 1.0. So I remember watching Sesame Street in real time. I mean, I was two when it debuted. So I don't remember oh, wow. seeing like the first episode or anything, but I know I was clearly watching early on because I sang Menomina until my, drove my mother insane. <laughs> Um, but I remember Herbert Birdsfoot coming in and then like, I, you know, I wasn't like, oh, they took Kermit out and brought in Herbert Birdsfoot. Like Kermit to me was just a character and Same. Herbert Birdsfoot to me was a character. So like, I didn't recognize that, you know, something had gone off the rails that Jim was trying to recover. Same. I mean, her, I mean, Herbert Birdsfoot was way before my time, yeah. but I, you know, we had, we had a couple of albums here that had that character had, on, had him on it. Yeah. And, and books. So, but I never actually saw him on the show proper until I was about, Seven, I think that was when those old school DVDs came out. Yeah. And there was such a big, di- for the listeners who, no, so, sorry to say this again, Brian, for the listeners who are my age that don't remember Herbert Bird's foot. Uh, so basically um, Kermit in the early seasons of Sesame Street, well, early in the whole time he was on Sesame Street, he was either a news reporter or a educator basically. Hi ho, Kermit the Frog here. And today I'm going to talk about the word round. That was one of my favorites. And yeah. and he would appear on on the street. He was one that in the early in the early episodes before they'd figured it out, he was actually permitted to like interact with the humans as well. So and then Jim Henson got too happen. busy. Yeah, that didn't always happen. Yeah. Well, they uh, there is an episode that I really want to see that featured Kermit on the street. Maybe you probably might have seen it. Uh let me see if I'll test your knowledge a little bit, but Kermit got sick and was staying at Susan and Gordon's apartment and throughout that sickness was constantly interacting with people from the window. Ah, uh, I don't remember that one. Okay. I really, I really want to see this one. It, it, see, my, my favorite Kermit it, newsman is uh, the three little pigs when he's with the count and the count <laughs> wants to count them every time. And it's just got one of the lines yeah. that kills me every time. It's Frank Oz. It's when he opens the door and the pigs appear at the door and the count starts counting them and the thunder goes and one of the pigs immediately goes, what was that? And, and there's Rich, something and about the Hunt way- was, And Richard Hunt was doing the next pig, shut the door, I think it's gonna rain. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, there's something about the way Oz delivers that line that just kills me. I feel like that was totally improvised, but with it's this- It's so funny. That, that bit is just brilliant. It kind of falls apart at the end with the seven doors, but it's, it's just, that, that oh, is one of my man. all-time favorite sketches. Yeah. But with this Herbert Bird, Birdsfoot character. So basically, it's similar to the case of Nigel, like Jim Henson wanting to create a new character. Uh, Sesame Street created a new character to fit to basically take on Kermit's role. Uh, Herbert Birdsfoot. Um, he was played by Jerry Nelson. I think it was one of Jerry's first characters he did coming into Sesame Street because he was brand new. Him and Richard right. Hunt and Fran Brill, who I know. Uh, I've talked to Fran a couple of times. Um, basically, they they were new to Sesame Street. And so 
Jerry got a handful of new characters, including my favorite, Harry, and also Herbert Birdsfoot. It would be like a, hi, Herbert Birdsfoot here. And today, Grover and I are going to talk to you about Over and Under. That was my yeah. particular favorite. And Grover. Yeah, see, and, and I think the problem you had with Herbert is I don't think he's a boring character or anything like that. I think he's too professorial. I don't think in Sesame Street yeah. you want that. You, you don't want it to feel like teaching mm. because that's that was that was romper room. That was actually educational TV before Sesame Street. It was like the educator. It's like Mr. Very Rogers. Very seriously, and like, let me explain these concepts to you. You know, they didn't want that in Seventh Street, and actually having Herbert Birdsfoot there acting like a professor just, mm -hmm. I, I think that, I think that wrecks the the rhythm of Sesame Street. Yeah. Um. Somebody on uh, on YouTube said that um, uh, the exact words were Herbert did not pack the same punch as Kermit, and he barely packed a punch at all because Kermit would absolutely go bananas if the tiniest thing went wrong with his lectures like there was a there were some early skits where uh here, here's a good example from the first ever sesame street kermit was talking about the letter w and a blue monster with googly eyes who became known as cookie monster this was before he was cookie monster ate pieces off the letter w of the letter w right. turning into an n and then a v kermit's like oh okay here i am talking about the letter n right. and and as and as he notices Cookie Monster is eating the end. He's like, and there's a couple of letter ends in the word nincompoop. Therefore, a right. little, little bit of an insult there toward Cookie <laughs> Monster. <laughs> yeah, Kermit. Yeah, Kermit loses it in those, and those are great. And I love Cookie Monster or Blue Monster, as they call them in those days. Like, I, eating, I always knew him as Cookie Monster. Eating salt shakers and telephones. I mean, like Cookie would eat anything. I still then. love the lecture with Cookie, Cookie Monster and Kermit, where Kermit was talking about same and different with these rectangles, and Cookie Monster took a bite out of one of them. And Kermit's like, well, now they're not the same. And so he's like, okay, yeah, I'll fix that. Bites the other one. Okay, now they're the same. No, they're not. They're not the same at all. This one, delicious. And this one, yucky. <laughs> and I was always a big fan of um, Grover and Mr. Johnson. And oh, Batman. God. And in fact, when I was doing research at the Henson Company archives, one of the, <laughs> there weren't a lot of Muppets there at the time, but there was a rack hanging over to one side and Fat Blue was on the rack over there. So did, I didn't did, see him. Did you put him on? No, I didn't. Oh, I never, man. I never put a puppet on. It felt, it felt too uh, disrespectful to do that. So I didn't, I never touched any of them. Um, the crazy? hardest one I is, I would have totally done that. Uh, the hardest one was um, Grover was actually there uh, getting outfitted in his Iron Man costume. Oh, there. cool. Uh, so he was actually on a stand on the table and they were building an outfit for it. Another one who was there was Bobo Bear and they were building a cop outfit for him, maybe? I think maybe, at, so at that time, so this was 2000, you know, 10, 11. So they might've been prepping Makes him sense. for, for you know, Muppets. The, the 2011 movie. Muppet movie. Yeah, they could have been prepping him for that. So it could be they were costuming for that because they, you know, they still are under contract to uh, build and costume the Muppets or the Sesame mm -hmm. Street Muppets over there. So, uh, so I did see Bobo and I saw Grover and then again, hanging on the rack was fat blue and one of the three little pigs, which was pretty awesome. Wow. And, and, that Snuff and, have, yeah. and Snuffy was hanging up in the ceiling. Oh man, that is amazing. Yeah. Uh, I never saw that, Big Bird or anything like that, but Snuffy was up at the ceiling. I'm very glad that you mentioned Bobo because uh, it's funny when you uh, instantly, when you were talking, when you brought up Muppets tonight, I thought to myself, oh, hi, Paul Rudolph. If you're listening just after our chat yesterday, he started <laughs> on Muppets tonight. <laughs> Uh, but I was telling Paul that uh, you've seen Muppets Tonight before, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. My very favorite uh, moment on Muppets Tonight was with Bobo and Cindy Crawford, where Bobo developed this big crush on Cindy Crawford. Oh, Bobo, is has Cindy Crawford showed up yet? Pretty. And takes very, very stupid advice from Rizzo. Rizzo is talking, <laughs> he's basically doing what I'm doing. And Bobo, like talking into a microphone from another room. Uh, it, the only difference is he wasn't that far away. I'm in Halifax. You're in New Mexico, right? Yep. Okay. And um, uh, basically, as soon as Rizzo says the first thing, um, uh, Bobo badly misinterprets it. And Rizzo says into the mic, oh, brother, you sure muffed that one, fatso. Which Bobo, <laughs> which Bo Bobo says to Cindy very stupidly. And then something a little very – something that probably the Muppets would not be allowed to do now <laughs> happens. But Rizzo's nephew is – oh, my God. I am, I am probably going to get shut down for doing this. But Rizzo's nephews come in and um, uh, they say, hi, Uncle Rizzo. We just came back from the fair. And they're holding – 
balloons and Rizzo, and Rizzo I guess has kind of forgotten that he's got the mic in his hand and he says maybe you let me play with them later which Bobo says to Cindy Crawford <laughs> <laughs> oh my god poor Bobo <laughs> uh, but with, with Muppets Tonight it was kind of like a little bit of a reboot of the Muppet show but rather than being set in a theater this i really liked it was set in a tv studio now yeah. i'm somebody who wants to work in television so that was kind of interesting because the muppet show didn't go that much behind the scenes what's your thoughts on that yeah well i mean that's you know that's the that was the issue with the the 2015 one too the muppets it's like where do you set them and they're like okay well it's tv and this time specifically it's a talk show mm -hmm. um and you know it was Rewatching that again, it does a lot of stuff right, actually. Uh, and Bill Beretta is just so funny. I mean, like you doing, you know, talking about him as Bobo and Muppets tonight, but like he's he's just so funny on, on the Muppets. Um, but I think, you know, again, it, it's you know, when I, I said that you can't let the conceit drive the character, the character has to drive the conceit. But you have to figure out the right place to put them. So I think like we're so familiar with them in the vaudeville theater that we still kind of need that sort of setting to mm, orient ourselves. Yeah. You, you can't do a Muppet sitcom you just you can can't try I mean, I mean you know maybe you know maybe you could do it do it like faulty towers almost or you know like new heart where like kermit is running a hotel and all these other crazy characters are in the hotel doing different things and miss piggy's you like have, you can have a theme song be happiness hotel from great muppet caper right but it but it would give you an opportunity to have like everybody doing something different and it, it would explain why why they're all there and then it would give you the opportunity to like have your guest stars come in as guests at the hotel. Um, and you know, so you could get away with it then. But so you've got to find the right setup for them. And, and it is it does make perfect sense because we were in the vaudeville theater in the seventies, like to now then move to a TV show. I mean, Jim himself was trying to do that with the, you know, with the lead free TV approach that eventually became the Jim Henson hour where it's like they were still, they still had the sort of the TV studio booth and Kermit mm. would select, you know, what they were going to look at. And you were like, why did you pick that? Um, but, you know, it was still, it was still a familiar enough setup. Um, that, you know, you can see why they went there with that. So, right. so it's, you know, it's, it's fun to see them trying to figure out what that setup is. I don't, I don't know what you do. I just don't, I just don't think you can do a typical sitcom um, with the Muppets where it's like, oh, it's, you know, it's just like, you know, they're all neighbors somehow and, mm. and they're leaving, you know, and out of each other's world. I, I don't know how you do it. So, and I don't know what the tolerance level is nowadays for a variety show. Mm, um, that's one of the other things. Yeah. And that's one of the things with the Muppets, um, you know, they didn't quite know what to do with their guest stars. Oh. You know, on the Muppet show, the guest stars come in and they get to sing, they get to dance, a little seltzer down the pants. Um, in the Muppets, they come in and they're there for like three minutes and maybe, you know, Dave Grohl was playing a song on this Piggy show. So we see that, but they're not incorporated into the overall plot which the Muppet show, they would incorporate them into what was going on in that episode. It's funny you mentioned Dave Grohl's drum battle with Animal. Paul told me yesterday that he was there for that. So. Oh, how great. Yeah. And see, and Dave Grohl's a guy who like, who like, get who like gets the Muppets. Oh, like, absolutely. It would be, it would be yeah. great to have like an episode where he was like a legit guest star um, instead of just like making an appearance on it. Like he would be great with the Muppets. Like just throw him into the mix. He'd be awesome. And of course, they did a drum battle with uh, Buddy Rich, Buddy Rich and of course, yeah. with uh, a Muppet Show guest who is beloved by so many. And I'm sure you know who I'm referring to, Harry Belafonte. That is, it, it's not an episode that I talked about earlier, but it's one I'm going to talk about now, I guess. But yeah, it was it was powerful because of the closing number I felt, Harry Belafonte's song, Turn the World Around. Right. Um, and the way he was describing it before performing. And it was such a powerful performance that it just, rolled through the entire credits and he sang it at Jim Henson's memorial service. It really shows the impact that that had on not just Jim Henson and the Muppet performers, but on the fans as well. Right. Mm. Well, and you know, and Jim and Harry Belafonte actually went back a ways. I mean, Jim oh, I goes back further that. with Harry than Harry goes with Jim in the sense that one of the, the first time Jim and Jane went on a date together, they went to a Harry Belafonte show. Oh, wow. Um, so, so, you know, so they went back further. Harry didn't know that. So Jim's memory of Harry goes back further than Harry's with Jim. But, um, you know, Harry Belafonte meant a lot to, to Jim and to Jane. Um, mm. And that's one reason right there. But, but I, I just did a big, uh, another podcast where I was counting down the, you know, the top 10 social justice moments on the Muppet show. And that was number one. 
oh, yeah. um, because of that message and because it's so beautifully done and because it did end up at Jim's memorial service. And the other thing I love about that, and it gets to Jim's ethic as well, is when they were getting ready to put together that scene and they've got the African mass and they're at, like Jim said, please be sure this doesn't represent anything real. Please be mm. sure this isn't like an actual tribal mask because I don't want anybody getting offended or having us misuse or misappropriate somebody's religious imagery or somebody's ceremonial imagery. I mean, it's like really important to Jim on that. So they made sure that like, that was all just, you know, it was masks that resembled actual tribal masks, but weren't real tribal masks. Mm. And so many episodes that are on Disney plus now have a disclaimer. Uh, this has uh, Im uh, images that might offend viewers because of uh, stereotypes these were wrong then and they were wrong now like take for example two particular episodes spike milligan which has every Whew. you know there yeah thank you and <laughs> and marty feldman which did the arabian nights right and mm. did they did they put it at the front of the johnny cash one there's a confederate flag at one point in there it's not it doesn't have anything to do with the plot it's just like background decoration but that that was one maybe, i maybe i'll have to, i'll have to I'll have to go I'll, look at that one too yeah me too you know johnny cash was uh, was pretty good a lot of these uh, celebrities who came on the muppet show my like the muppet show was around when my parents were in single digits a lot of them my my dad liked i mentioned alice cooper um and my and uh my grandfather grumpy that's i told this to joe hennes and ryan rowe and to paul rudolph also and he's come on this youtube channel before but ever since i've known how to talk i have called my grandfather grumpy kind of like a little pet name but that is stuck <laughs> for that's stuck for 22 years and um yeah he likes a lot of the artists that were on the muppet show uh, johnny cash but i will say when some celebrities come on the muppet show that are known for some songs there are songs that I'm kind of disappointed that they don't perform. Like, for example, Johnny Cash. My favorite by him is Get Rhythm. He could have easily done that. Hey, get a rhythm. When yeah. you get the booze, come on, get a rhythm. I could have seen him doing that. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, but on the other hand, Mac Davis comes on and does kind of what you expect him to sing. Elton John, definitely, you know, Crocodile Rock. I mean, he doesn't disappoint there. Mm -hmm. So what, what I love about the Muppet Show is they would get guests in to do stuff you didn't expect. Like you get, you know, Beverly Sills with the spoon on her nose and oh Sylvester Stallone dancing. And, you know, I mean, that was the great thing about that show. It was very safe. And, you know, Jerry Joel and the team, they would, you know, in David Laser as producer, his contributions cannot be understated. You know, David Laser was the one who took care of the guests and took care of them very well. And they prided right. themselves on really taking care of their guests and picking them up in a, you know, limousine at the airport and putting them in a great hotel. And especially in those first seasons, they paid basically scale. Uh, which at the time I think was like three thousand dollars or something. So you know you're getting you're getting a list guests in a sense <laughs> for scale. Um, then because you know Bernie Brillstein was digging into his Rolodex. You probably don't know what a Rolodex is. It was a thing that I've heard the, of that. The, it was a thing where all the contact information was when we actually had to print it out. Oh yeah, um, yeah, I do, I do know what those are. And it was I've never heard the name Rolodex. That, that was a brand name. It was like Xerox, but it was a Rolodex, but it was this thing. That, anyway, and, now, and, and now you can just go through contacts in your phone. Right, exactly right. But so, you know, Bernie Brillstein called in favors for that. And so, but they took really good care of their guests. That was pivotal. They wanted everyone to have a nice time. They were only going to be there a week anyway. Mm. Um, some of them were doing favors for them, but they would ask them, what would you like to do? And as the show got established, they would even ask, what Muppet would you like to do something with? And they stopped asking that question at some point, apparently, because everybody said Miss Piggy. Mm. Uh, and they were like, we got we to gotta mix it up a little bit. Well, my but, favorite story about that was with James Coburn when uh, he was asked, what Muppet do you want to work with? And he said, Animal. And I, uh, I, remember, I remember watching that one for the first time. And um, basically, Animal was beating a chair and James was like hold on I'm gonna try to do my best James Coburn impression because I'm a <laughs> I, I'm a Disney kid so for me it's Monsters Inc uh right actually teaser for the regular listeners here I'm, a, I'm gonna be doing a Monsters Inc video really soon so stay tuned for that I'm not gonna say what I'm gonna do but I'm gonna do a bonus video where I'm gonna be showing some cool Monsters Inc stuff but anyway with James Coburn he says to Animal there's right and wrong ways to handle aggression Oh my God, that does sound like him. I'm just hearing it come into my headphone. <laughs> anyway, there's right and wrong ways to handle aggression. You don't bust a chair up like that. Bust it up like this. Right. <laughs> and then and then he relaxes animal enough so that it meditates him. That out that one also came with a disclaimer because they did a little Japanese number. Uh 
Yeah, because I'm wondering if like the whole booma booba, like if they put a, you know, if they have to put a zucchini disclaimer on brothers, that one for yeah. the zucchini brothers, yeah, or you know, for the booma booma. Mm. So, uh, so I don't like I said, I haven't made my way through all of them yet, but mm. uh, but anyway, the whole point was they took great care of their guests. Some of them were doing them favors, but it got to be the show everybody wanted to do, and they would ask them, "What excites you? What would you like to do? Which muffin would you like to do it with? Would you like to do something different than you always do?" So that may that may be, and I don't know this for a fact, but that may be part of the reason why some of those singers come in. They're like. I'm not I'm not doing the top 10 hit right now. <laughs> you know, I'd rather do yeah. something else. But it's well, great seeing Paul Williams on there doing, you know, yeah. old, old fashioned, fashioned love, love song, song with the, you know, with the Muppets that look like him. I mean, just so much fun. Yeah. Well, I, I was talking uh, earlier about some good uh, zingers uh, on the Muppet show. Like uh, one I mentioned was Carol Burnett. She had some good zingers in there. But since you were mentioning Elton John, I thought of uh, one where uh, – Kermit said to him, our gopher, scooter, and Elton's, not, Elton's like, oh, frogs, pigs, chickens, bears, now you have a gopher. Kermit's like, oh, no, that's just a theater term, someone to go for coffee. You get it? No. Okay, well, he has an uncle who owns a theater who wants you to, who, uh, he, and he wants you to hear a song. Please hear it. So Scooter plays the song, and Kermit's like, oh, that is so bad. That song, it tastes, it's, oh, that has no melody. Elton, isn't it the worst song you ever heard? Well, didn't think so when I wrote it. <laughs> and for the listeners who don't know, and if you're an Elton John fan, like most of my family is, it was Benny and the Jets. So right. Kermit really, really stooped pretty low to insult <laughs> Elton John for his own music. But it, and after I, after I had rewatched, actually, uh, I walk every day. And um, the day I was doing the show with um, the Tough Pigs guys, I uh, like I have music on when I walk and I listen to obviously songs from the 90s most of most of the time like Backstreet Boys obviously um, but I was listening to Don't Go Breaking My Heart and it's coming into my headphone and immediately all I was visualizing was him singing it with Miss Piggy I feel like Elton John because he was like that was the first Muppet Show episode I ever saw and the audience screams were louder. Like usually it would be like applause and whistling, but this time it sounded like young girls whooping. <laughs> Cause this was like when Elton John was, oh, I'm sorry, Elton John, if you're listening, but when Elton John was a little bit younger, I really hate to say that now. Um, so, you know, he was like, I think he was in his late twenties at the time. So he was basically a teen idol. And um, so the audience cheering was screaming pretty well. Um, so he, I think he did more musical performances than any Muppet show guest because normally they would do about two or three. Right. He did four. Right. He did Crocodile Rock, Benny and the Jets, uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. He did that one beautifully on the Muppet show. And of course, Don't Go Breaking My Heart with Miss Piggy. And, um, there's a moment where Miss Piggy, uh, looks at the camera and she says, eat your heart out, Kiki, referencing Kiki D. <laughs> Kiki D. And I, it's going back to the Backstreet Boys. Uh, Backstreet Boys actually have a song called Don't Go Breaking My Heart. It's fairly new. It's not like the millennium era, like the I want it that way, quit playing games with my heart as long as you love me era. But it, uh, I remember when that album came out, it was called DNA. It was two years ago. I was at school and uh, I put on the whiteboards in our classes, BSB DNA, because it was all over Twitter. And uh, I showed my friends the, uh, the track list. The first song was their song, Don't Go Breaking My Heart. And my friend Jack is singing the Elton John song. And I'm like, no, no, no. It goes like, baby, don't go <laughs> breaking my heart. Breaking my heart. Yeah, the only one, we, only one people my age would know would be the Elton John and Kiki D one. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> these, uh, you, you Backstreet Boys haters out there have no taste. <laughs> Oh, I'm not a hater. I still know the song. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, what was so interesting about the Muppet show as well, and uh, partly because, you know, a lot of it, at least in those early seasons, was them calling in favors, is there's a lot of showbiz people in there who you're like, when I was a kid, I'm like, I'm, you know, I mean, you're talking now like the generation gap. Even back then, I'm like, I don't know who any of these are. Roy Rogers. I mean, I don't know who Roy Rogers mm. is. <laughs> My parents did, which is what made the Muppet show great. It was both people, yeah. you know, different generations. Like, you know, I was like, Connie Stevens. Julia mm. Prowse. I mean, it's like I didn't know. Yeah, you know, Mac Davis. I knew him because he'd been on the Scooby Doo movies. Oh yeah, um, I love Scooby Doo. You know, and Steve Martin. Movie. You know, I knew the you know Gilda Rat or something like that. But there were a lot in those that showed up, and I'm like, I don't know who some of these people are. Mm. Have you ever been like? Have you ever seen any Muppet Show guest like live? Like been to a concert or seen them perform or anything? Mm -mm. I don't think so. Okay, I only ever saw one. On the list, but I don't think I don't think so. Okay, I only ever saw one, 
and it was John Cleese. Um, he ah. was doing a stand-up show here in um, in Halifax at our hometown arena. It's called the Scotia Bank Center. It's uh, it's where the Halifax Mooseheads, that's our hockey team, play hockey. Uh, it's it's a big arena, but it's not like Madison Square Garden in New York or Staples Center in L.A. or Bell right. Center in Montreal. Uh, that Bell Center is huge, and um, Basically, uh, John Cleese did like a university lecture and at the end he took some Q&A and I was so tempted to ask, uh, there was like 8,000 people in this hockey arena and I was so tempted to ask, when you were on the Muppet show, did you feel comfortable working with any certain Muppet performer? And I had a feeling, I thought to myself, okay, don't ask him that because if he answers with something like Jim Henson, Frank Oz, you know, some right. people might know who they are, but you say a name like Jerry Nelson, Richard Hunt, Dave Goals, Louise Gold, who, were, who all were in that episode, they're going to be like, who are these people? And who's the nerd? <laughs> who's the nerd that's asking? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And you always uh, wonder if like Richard Hunt, because Richard Hunt was pretty crazy. And Richard Hunt was actually, you know, the one who was openly smoking pot. <laughs> that's, <laughs> never, that's what I always heard. Never while they were there. But I mean, he was the guy that could, I could get it for he and Jerry Nelson. But so I always wonder, like, you know, if maybe people like, like Frank Oz talked about when um, when uh, they did the uh, the Miss Piggy show, the fabulous Miss Piggy show and, and Andy Coffin's on there in full on. Tony Wait, was that was that the persona. one that was was that the one that was shot in Canada? I think so. And, and okay, Andy, yeah. And, and I, Andy and Andy uh, Kaufman is like full on Tony Clifton, like never breaking character. Yeah, we have um, we have. And, a, but Oz talked about how like the pot smoke was coming out from under Kaufman's door just constantly, constantly. Yeah, we, there was a there was there were a couple of Fraggle Rock puppeteers who performed on that. One of which is actually from here, a man named Terry Angus, and another past guest on the show, by the way, Tim Gosley, uh, who's done a bunch of other Canadian uh, puppet shows. Um, but yeah, with John Cleese, um, he, he was, he was funny, but he was very serious, but I will say the yeah. funniest thing I ever saw him talk about there was he was answering someone's question. I forget what the question was, but he says, I'm 80. I have two artificial hips and artificial knee and I'm losing my hair. And they probably asked him to do the silly walks. Cause he wouldn't do that. Cause he'd blown his knees out and his hips so badly from doing the silly walks for so well, long. Our, it used to be um, that like, it used to be that he would say like, uh, they would ask him to do the silly walk on like, you know, Dick Cavett or something. And he would say, Oh, I'll go over here and do it. And he would just walk it off camera and he wouldn't actually do it. And he would just well, when it. I, when I saw <laughs> him, when I saw him, our local anchor uh, news reporter, Jason Baxter, who I've met a couple of times. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny. I was talking about my aunt Deb. One time we were all out to dinner and Jason Baxter and his wife sat right next to us. And I had met him once before. I didn't think he'd remember me. And he gets up and I was like, hi, Jason. And he's like, Hi. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay. He kind of recognizes me. And he's like, what's the big occasion? Someone's birthday or something? And I said, no, nope, little family get together. Some people are in town from being away. And my friend's daughter, who is young, as soon as Jason leaves, she's like, it's the TV dude. <laughs> and my sister's like, how do you know him? And I was like, I only ever met him once. But anyway, Jason Baxter came on, he introduced John Cleese and he came on stage doing the walk. Oh, did he? John Cleese did? No, Jason Baxter. Jason did. Oh, okay. I was yeah. going to say, yeah, because John Cleese just won't do it anymore. John Cleese walked very slowly with his hand on his back. Yeah. No, I, I, like I said, I, I believe that the years of doing the silly walks like took its toll on him. Mm. <laughs> so well, he, he was on Just for Laughs in Montreal, and so were the Muppets at one point. But when he was on Just for Laughs, he uh, had like, – this was around the time of like American Idol when it was really, really popular. And he did a Cleese Idol, the next John Cleese. Mm. And – um. Somebody did the walk and he shot him. He had a gun and he he shot the actor. Well, not re I hope not really. You can never tell when it's not, when it's like it looked like mime almost. And then he <laughs> leaves and he's like, and especially for people like Ben Mulrooney, who's like a very popular Canadian TV presenter. I don't know if you know who Ben Mulrooney is. Um, but he says, especially for Ben Mulrooney, I have a special gift for all my Canadian fans. Yeah, what? <laughs> At Ben Mulrooney. At Ben Mulrooney. Uh, poor, I, I have a feeling that Ben Mulrooney probably was 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 feeling different things. Like, oh man, jo I I just got mime shot by John Cleese. Oh man, I just got mime shot by John Cleese. Well, you know the I mean, the Muppet writers wanted the entire Python crew to show up on the oh. show. Like that was on their wish list of of people they wanted. Like Jim would ask them, like who you know, put together a list of of you know ideal guest stars, especially by season three when they could get almost anybody they wanted 
And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, I talked a little bit about it in the book, but, it, you know, it's like Jim's lists were very like old school. You know, he's like, how about Mae West? And everyone's like, Mae West. But, you know, but the writers were like, we need Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> you know, they wanted all these really interesting, Michael Caine, who, they, you know, who shows up in Muppet Treasure Island. Muppet or, uh, Christmas Carol, actually. Christmas Carol. But, you know, but it's like they would, they would, you know, come up with these really interesting choices. But the, the Python crew was on there. Um, and I told the story in the book, but they really wanted the Beatles um and and made a and made a run at them like actually you know tried to and mccartney uh through his people responded that um you know he thought it was really interesting and they loved the muppets but he was going to commit ringo they nearly got oh um, so close. i don't i don't think they heard back from george or john now um on twitter a while back sean lennon was tweeting out how he and john loved watching the muppet show together Oh, cool! But it made. But he said it was very frustrating because um, because um, John would reach over during the commercials and turn the TV off, <laughs> and then would just randomly then decide later to turn it back on. Oh, and I wow. said something like, "Well, I'm sure that like you know what Sean meant is like his dad was just like turning the volume down." And and Sean actually responded back to me. He's like, "No, he turned it off." <laughs> so, but uh, you know, so anyway, it's nice to know John Lennon loved that show. Uh, but it's just one of those things that like when I came across that in the archives, I was like, oh, my God, the Beatles, that would be so amazing. But they, you know, McCartney's people responded. Ringo, they almost got Harrison never responded. And John didn't respond. But we do know that he loved watching the show. So. Well, I, I will say to, to my best friend, Sean, if you are listening to this, she loves the Beatles. Like, I, I don't mind the Beatles. She loves them way more than I do. Sean, if you are listening to this, there's an interesting little story for you. And I think I think Ringo, if they could have just gotten even Ringo on, and Ringo would be great on the Muppet Show. I mean, Ringo was their, you know, sort of their, you know, he's, he was the Charlie Chaplin esque one from, you know, Hard Day's Night. Like he would have been great with the Muppets. I think he'd had a great time. So that's mm. one of those where, you know, one of the what might have been's on there. But just looking down the list of, you know, guests that they really wanted or would, you know, were kicking around was really interesting. Mm. Um, again, to see that the writers, especially one of these really ambitious, I think Bowie was on the list again, get him in labyrinth in a different mm, way, yeah. but it's like, they, you know, they really wanted these really interesting guests. Mm. Well, I've got many interesting guests, including you who have come on this show. So, uh, but actually um, my uh, Sean and I are also big fans of the Backstreet Boys. Oh, shocker, right? You know, after <laughs> what you've learned about me so far, uh, and I, had, be, being a big Muppet fan and a writer, I used to, my friends and I, we used to do our own little Muppet show. And I, uh, this was when we were like 11, 10, 11, 12, I had my puppets and I would have these puppets that weren't, they, they weren't like Miss Piggy or Fozzie. I would just pretend they were because that's right. fun. And my friends were the guest stars because we were celebrities in each other's eyes. And, um, I remember I came up with this backstage plot that a new act was trying to get on the Muppet show and they were called the backstage boys. <laughs> <laughs> and I did, and I did this little like, cause uh, okay, I'm going to clarify another little thing for the listeners. So the Muppet show, uh, basically it, it, it aired worldwide. And so in non U S markets, it ran, like on stations where they had less commercials or maybe even no commercials. So to fill in that time, they had these little things called UK spots. And right. sometimes they would be like a song or a skit or maybe even something backstage. My particular favorite was Sam the Eagle talking with Kermit in the prop room about what was going to be on the show. Uh, and I actually came up with a UK spot featuring the backstage boys, them singing, quit playing games with my heart, quit playing games with my heart before you tear us apart, quit playing games with my, I should have known from the start, you know you gotta stop, you're tearing us apart. Quit playing games with my heart. Quit playing games, baby, <laughs> baby. Okay, I need to shut up, uh, uh, but, yeah, and I actually, I was telling Joe and Ryan that I remember my friends Maggie and uh, Ben doing a version of a rap song uh, called You're a Jerk. Uh, yes, that's the name of the song, and they did a little dance to it. I have a video of it somewhere. I'm, I don't know if I still do, but I must. But basically, it was like, you're a jerk. I know. You're a jerk. I know. And we kind of incorporated that into our own Muppet show. And um, I do remember there was a song at the time. Are you familiar with a singer named Kesha? Yes. Okay. Uh, she was very new at the time. Uh, she had that song, TikTok. Uh, my friends and I really liked that. And I remember Ben and 
Maggie singing that. And my mom reads the lyrics, brush my teeth with a bottle of Jack. And I was like, maybe maybe we could rearrange that we were 11 so <laughs> so i had you know, a, but you never know what that's you don't even know what that stuff means when you sing it so yeah well not at the time but my mom's like okay you are not using the word bottle of jack because <laughs> now i know <laughs> I, I got i eventually got it. i was like oh it's beer uh, i don't drink i'm legally of age to drink but i don't and um i remember uh, i changed i changed the line just for a video and i had a puppet on that i was pretending was dr teeth who was doing the backup for um um uh for tiktok and um yeah we were the original tiktokers i'll say and the line had changed to brush my teeth with my friend jack and i come on as dr teeth and i'm like hey hey, that's that's not the line indicating this is this is not a child-friendly song and we're 11 years old (laughs) Uh, but i do remember ryan a friend of mine doing not ryan Rowe, uh another guy who's my age uh ryan o'hearn and he was he i I basically wanted him to sing this song that should have totally been sung on the Muppet show because it was at the time sister golden hair by America. Do you know it? Mm, yeah. One of the first songs I ever heard, actually the first song I ever heard, believe it or not was backstreet boys and Britney Spears, <laughs> but sister golden hair was one of the first non boy band songs I ever heard uh, as a kid. And I remember Ryan's like, I don't know the song. And I was like, just lip sync it. It's like, I don't know it. And I was like, okay, I'll start. So I had I had it on a CD and so I was lip syncing. Well, I keep on thinking about you. And I had a puppet that I was pretending was Floyd. So to make the bass playing look believable, I had uh, oh, too bad I don't have a puppet here besides the Miss Piggy puppet. Uh, but that doesn't have enough rods for me to actually explain it. But basically, I would have the um, the right hand right on the left rod to make it look like it was playing guitar or something. Ah, uh, yeah. Very smart. Yeah. So eventually after that came the 2011 Muppet movie, which kind of was a little bit like showing the original Muppet show to younger audiences who had never seen the Muppet show before, but their parents probably did. I mean, I watched the Muppet show before that movie came up, but my friends, like when, when they saw it, they didn't know. And I was like, oh, that was a real TV show. They're like, wait, really? And so then I finally got them introduced to it. So what were your thoughts on the 2011 Muppet movie and the fact that it kind of just was a revival of the Muppet show for young kids? Um, I liked the 2011 movie, actually. Me too. Um, It's like my favorite film. It's it's astounding to me that, I mean, not not astounding. It's, uh, you know, that's the first Oscar that the Muppets have ever won. Oh, yeah. Because the song from that, Life's... uh, Man or Muppet. No, was that the one that won? Yeah, Man or Muppet yep. was the one that won, wasn't it? Yeah, um, that, which to me it isn't the best song in the movie, but um, but won the Oscar. It's the very first time the Muppets have ever won an Oscar when uh, Rainbow Connection was nominated and lost to It Goes As It Goes from Norma Ray, which is a terrible, terrible song. Can you sing it? No, because it's an awful song. I don't song. even Rainbow- know it. I don't either. But no, it's you know it's one of those Jennifer Warren songs, I guess. But it's but like, it's not Muppets, you know, <laughs> right? But I mean, it's like Rainbow Connection was just robbed. But so it's it's weird to me to like that's actually the first Oscar the Muppets have ever won. Mm, it was uh, weird so. to me too at the time. And, um, and they actually acknowledged Jim Henson when they accepted the the Oscar, which was awesome. Oh, yeah, so, so that was, that was awesome. But I I really like uh, the 2011 movie. I remember talking with. Uh, Karen Falk and she was like Kermit's so sad in it though <laughs> but you know but I was like but it's you know it's like the Blues Brothers in a way it's like we're putting yeah. the band back together you know so it's like well with with Kermit being thing. sad that actually like my favorite song in that movie is Pictures in My Head I told Steve Whitmire you did it so beautifully and I also told him this um I mean this show is called Nostalgia Talk and it's mostly about nostalgic media but I've always been such a nostalgic person, like even watching a TV show from my youth, like let's say it's a show from the year 2006, for example. Like I I remember things that happened in these years. Like you could just name something that happened, a minor detail. And I'm like, oh yeah, that was on Saturday, August 5th, 2006, which is actually a real calendar date. August 5th in 2006 was a Saturday. And um, basically anytime a memory comes in my head of a friend or uh, something I did with them, especially with a best friend who lives on the other side of the ocean, on the other side of the world, rather. Um, the one I was talking about uh, earlier, Sean, um, you know, I listen to that song. If I, I, I like, sometimes I just want to, I just want to cry. I miss them so much. And so I just <laughs> listen to that song. Yeah. 
Oh my God, Steve. Yeah, that'd be, you... it's, it's just, it's, it's a great movie. Um, what's the opening number? Life's a happy song. Yeah. Like, I love, I love that song and done so well. And that one to me is like a very Muppety type song. And like the way it's produced, it's like a very, it's a very Muppet moment. I mean, you've got characters being added to it and you're changing venue and people are coming in and out of it and there's random people showing up. I think it just like totally works. Mm. Um, so I think that's a really strong opening in that movie. But, mm. uh, but I actually like, I actually like that movie and I actually think Muppets Most Wanted is okay. Everyone kind of dumps on that one, but I think, yeah. I think it's all right. I can, I can see why Disney threw the talent in after that. Uh, I wish they would pick it up again. Um, now that they've got some different people at the helm there inside Disney, but um, you know, I, th- maybe I thought maybe they will. A- maybe they will. You never know. Well, that's what I'm here, and you know, and, and the Muppet Show being on Disney Plus now. I mean, you know, it, it's a uh, it, it's the new gateway drug now for the Muppets. I mean, the, the the new gateway drug is the old one at this point now. You know, it takes something 40 years old to get people interested in the Muppets again. But I think it's the best thing they could do to get people interested in the Muppets again. You know, people are often, you know, upset with Disney saying they don't know what to do with the Muppets. Yeah, um, they I acquired it and they know it. Well, what, the best thing they could have done, they finally did, which was get all five seasons out there for God's sake mm. um, and putting them out there. And everyone's like, well, I'd like to have them on DVD. Okay, that would be nice. But the best thing you can do is have them streaming or anyone. Yeah, I, mean, like, I know you have to have Disney, but like yeah. anybody can grab them, grab any episode at any time. It's the perfect gateway drug for the Muppets. Yeah. Well, since we've been talking about songs from the 90s, like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC and Jordan Knight, one of the, the my favorite number in Muppets Most Wanted is Constantine's uh, I Can Give You Anything You Want. I know that's not a 90s cover, but there were two 90s, well, two, three, but two on the soundtrack uh, that were in that song. I love the prison gang singing End of the Road by Boys to Men. I have a boy, <laughs> I have a Boys to Men album here. What a shocker. I have a boy band album. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, uh, them doing that was kind of interesting. Um, and I, I mean, I think you know, it's, I, I don't see any harm in keeping to continue to try with the Muppets because uh, they're know, so the worst they're thing so you can clever. Do, well, I think the worst thing you can do is, is bench them in frustration. Uh, you know, it, it's right. it, you you can't be sloppy in the writing. That's the main thing. And they've and where you can't be sloppy is as Frank Oz, Jerry Jewell, Jim, others all knew. Character matters the most. Mm. So you've, you've got to stay focused. I mean, that's, I think one of the things Jason Siegel did, right. Um, like he, I think he, he got that and the, the buddy movie set up after that was secondary. The characters were what mattered the most. Mm. And, and I think he really got that. So that's, you know, moving forward, that's, would I love to see them coming back for a regular weekly series? Yeah. But as we were discussing earlier, finding that setup is tough. Especially um, with Muppets now, the latest streaming series. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think you've just got to figure out what do you do? And, you know, I, again, I'm going to stand by my hotel idea now that I just threw out of there at random, but I mean, that's a way you can do it. It, it, It's a way of explaining why all these weirdo characters are in the same location together, you know, where, where, unless it's a prison where they're all incarcerated together. Like in Muppets Most Wanted. Exactly right. It's like, but a hotel would work. So I I don't know. I did. they've, They've got to figure out the conceit, but I really hope they'll keep trying. Yeah, but I did love Miss Piggy doing um, Macarena, another good 90s song. And also, I love Celine Dion. Like, I l- absolutely love Celine Dion. I have the Let's Talk About Love album here. I have a – no, I, no, seriously, I do. And um, I love Miss Piggy not just singing with Celine Dion, uh, a fellow Canadian, by the way, right. but also her brief performance of um, – my heart will go on. That's my favorite. I I've watched Titanic. Uh, you know, I, I, I can handle that. I mean, it was an inter- it was an interesting film to watch, but at the same time, kind of sad. But I liked how they kept. I know this isn't to talk about Titanic, but well, you know that video. They actually filmed that at normal pace. They sped up the music and had her lip sync to the mu- music sped up, and then they slowed it back down, and which is why it what for for the, the Celine Dion My heart song? will go on video. Yeah. Oh, the, the original "My Heart Will Go On" video. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. For a minute, I thought you were talking about Miss Piggy's brief. No, 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 no. Since we're Muppets talking Muppets. about the original Titanic, I'm digressing mm-hmm. to that. But. Well, I was, I was telling Paul Rudolph that on Muppets Tonight, one thing they could have done is um, have Pepe singing uh, "I Like to Move It, Move It." I like to move it, move it. I, or "Wannabe" by the Spice Girls. So tell me what you want, what you really, really don't want. Okay, tell me what you want, what you really, really don't want. And again, Bill Beretta. Bill Beretta is just so funny. Bill, so Bill, funny. if you are listening to this, do you want to try singing all of these '90s songs? Like, the prom I mean, it, is back. All right. That's that's where the 2015 series like was starting to like find its footing. I think. Was what with that, Bill Beretta? 
Well, that second half of the season, when what did they do? They focused more on the characters because mm-hmm. they threw everybody onto the show now. I mean, you can, you can actually see that, that series pivoting where they're like, you know what? It's not just the Miss Piggy show. There's actually that moment when the consultant comes in and they're like, we're going to let everybody be on the show. And all of a sudden, it starts to get interesting. Yeah. Because you've thrown everybody nice. into the mix. You've got everybody into the mix. And then every moment of Gonzo, Rizzo, and Pepe is gold. Because you've right. got three performers who are fantastic, who all know each other very well and have worked together for years. No, here, I'm going to use the word again, know each other's rhythms. Those three together, it is the most naturalistic type performing. It sounds absolutely like just three guys sitting around bullshit. It is so great. Those guys are so great together. Mm. And I also told Paul that one thing that would be kind of funny was uh, it would be Miss Piggy singing Kiss Me by Sixpence None the Richer. Because <laughs> if if you go back to the Muppet Show and watch her singing "I Won't Dance," it would it was just Kermit. Well, actually, no, it was Kermit singing "I Won't Dance" to Miss Piggy. It could be Miss Piggy singing "Kiss Me" to Kermit. Because one of my going back to the John Cleese episode, remember Miss Piggy singing? This was one of the UK spots. Miss Piggy singing "Waiting at the Church" with Kermit. It. Yeah, that was a duet. I can imagine "Kiss Me" being like. Uh, Miss Piggy singing Kiss Me by Sixpence None the Richer and then Kermit resisting it. But in for, for the listeners, I'll give you a little taste of waiting at the church. Uh, there was I waiting at the church, waiting at the church, waiting at the church. Though I found he left me in the lurch. Oh, how it did upset me. Dun, 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 dun. Though at once he left around a note. Here's the very note. This is what he wrote. Can't get away to marry you today. My wife won't let me. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. So I I have one final question just before we wrap up. If they brought back the Muppet Show the way that it was, what celebrities would you like to see on it? Oh, geez. Wow. Um... Well, that's a great question. And I was, I was, I was actually having this conversation with somebody and now I can't remember any of my answers for it. Um, well, again, I think, I think, uh, I think Dave Grohl would be great on it. I think oh, I yeah. mean, the Foo Fighters would be great anyway. And then Dave Grohl would be just awesome on there. Um, I think if you, you could, put, if you did, if you did that one, I can imagine that they could do um, the smells like teen spirit number from the uh, Muppets movie, like the barbershop quartet. But I mean, but look at, look at, remember the uh, learning, learning to fly video, like where he was playing, you know, the fat woman on the airplane. It's like, he's playing all the different parts and he's in drag. I mean, like Dave Grohl's just made for the Muppets. I don't think just, I have seen that one. I'm not really, oh I'm not really a Dave Grohl or Foo such Fighters such fan. A great video. Yeah. But, it's not um, Backstreet Boys. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, and, then, and that's actually from the late nineties. So I don't know, you know, but, um, you know, I, I think getting somebody like Rain Wilson, I think would be great on there. Oh yeah. Um, so I've got a music, you know, and I think you'd be capable of getting Tom Hanks. I mean, you could get like big names on there. Um, because you know, by, because by then the Muppet show is would you know, every, every, people who would people like Tom Hanks who were, yeah. I mean, Zendaya would be great on there. Oh, I love her. So, I mean, I think, I think you could, I, what'd be great is the, the Muppets are now established too. I think yeah. you could get anybody you wanted, mm. um, and just let him go nuts. I'd love to see, um, cause sometimes when I was doing the Muppet show, uh, stuff with my friends, of course my friends would be the guests, but we would, we would, we would pretend they were celebrities like i remember ryan doing um what's that song by stevie wonder sir duke oh yeah uh, so song. stevie wonder would, would have, he would even before even at the time of the muppet show he still would have been a good guest uh, yeah and he wasn't a guest that's right that's great he would have yeah been but he was on yeah. sesame street yeah. you know who'd be great dan levy would be great on the muppets like he'd be great yeah um I don't know. You could, you know, it it would be awesome to get like the entire Shit's Creek cast because you've got like that SCTV blood running through there, and the SCTV cast would have been fantastic on the Muppet Show. Well, actually, uh, speaking of that show, uh, which I I won't say the name of it because I'm a little anxious because uh, the title. But um, do you remember the character Jake, the pansexual? Uh huh. He's actually a friend of my family, Steve Lund. No kidding. Uh, how the story goes is my uh, my mom babysat. The kids, uh, and there was Chelsea was the oldest, Stephen 
was the middle. We, even though his acting name is Steve Lund, I, I said to him, is it okay if I still call you Steven? And he said, you can call me whatever you want. I was like, well, I'm not going to call you an idiot because you're not an idiot. And the youngest, Coco, well, her real name is Courtney, but it's like in the case of Grumpy, except it's not that much of an insulting name. Uh, we've been calling her Coco for years. That's, uh, and I, I'm sure that's a common nickname for people named Courtney. Um, she lives in New Zealand now, actually. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that would be another good guest to have on the Muppet Show, Steve Lund. You know, and if yeah. I ever make it to the Muppets one day, I have connections. So it, it, Bob Odenkirk would be great. Oh it. yeah, you know, I love I Bob mean, Odenkirk. Another quir- another quirky, you know, funny guy who you could throw into the mix. It, you know, it'd be like the old John Cleese episode. <laughs> I mean, you've got like somebody who's really funny, really dry, who would you could just throw into the middle of stuff. So. Yeah, Nate Cordry, my favorite Cordry. actor, my favorite actor ever, and I've actually talked with him on Twitter. So that oh my god, to have a conversation with Nate Cordry is a dream. And I even said to him, dude, you're my favorite actor. He's like, well, that really means a lot. And I was like, no, I'm serious. I want to work with you one day. <laughs> and you know, maybe if I make it to the Muppets, I'll I'll get my wish. So Nate Cordry, Disney, if you're listening, please make it happen. Uh, another guest I'd love to see, Sabrina Carpenter. Do you know who that is? Uh. Uh-uh. Okay, I love Sabrina Carpenter. She's my age. She's a singer, actress. She was on Girl Meets World. I've been yeah. to one of her shows, and the cast of Girl Meets World was actually there. They walked right by me, and I tried hard not to geek out. Actually, I met Peter Linz the next day. Peter Linz did as Walter, oh, Ernie, Harry. And, and that was actually at the D23 Expo, and they were promoting the ABC Muppet Show, so I got to watch the Muppeteers work. Oh, excellent. Not Muppeteer, um, Muppet performer. Sorry. Some, some people have referred to them as Muppeteer, like when they come on the show. I say Muppet performer. There Muppeteer you go. Good just man. Good Muppet, man. Muppet. I know. I know. Well, it's funny. Like, I, I used slipped to use, out, yeah. I used to use it, too, and I got slapped down for it. <laughs> so, so it's like, and I, I, know that, I know that Jim and Frank never cared for it. So, <laughs> sorry. Got, Lisa, Lisa Henson knocked me down a notch for that one. Yeah. Uh, other guests I'd really like to see. What a surprise. Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, 98 Degrees, Justin Timberlake. Um, Justin Timberlake would be great. Yeah. Leah Michelle. Leah Michelle would be all right. Uh, Billie Eilish even would be interesting on there just because oh, yeah. she's so weird. I, I, I came up with this idea once, uh, speaking of boy band members, uh, I came up with this thing where the Muppets were scrambling to get a guest star on short notice. And they uh, and there was a smoke coming from the kitchen. And the Swedish chef was saying, well, what happened? And they explained, we have a new chef. And I visualized the chef as Joey Fatone. <laughs> Like, you know, somebody, I, I saw somebody on Twitter, um, I almost responded back to them. They were very upset that the Swedish chef is being subtitled as mock Swedish. Mm, well, that's like kind of necessary. Like they're not spelling it out phonetically, which can make the joke. Yeah. Uh, who, who else would be great to be on The Muppet Show? Um, I'm sure my sister would have an answer to that. And her answer would be Taylor Swift. She's obsessed with Taylor Swift. Yeah, uh, I'm and not. See, they, get, they, they could probably get, and they could probably get her too. So. Yeah, um, you mentioned Zendaya, and I love Zendaya. I, I'm, again, I'm a Disney kid, so shake it up. And right. That, like, that, <laughs> and KC Undercover. That's my era. I was I was in my preteen years. Um, oh God, who else? Um, well, since I was taught, well, since I mentioned Backstreet Boys and the Backstage Boys, I'd love to see them take to see Disney take that idea because the Backstreet Boys did a Disney concert, which I think I watched when it was brand new. I was only a few months old, but it would be kind of interesting to see them kind of redo that yeah. with the Muppets and have the Backstage Boys idea. Well, I mean, you know, speaking of Broadway, I mean, he's been on Sesame Street, but, but like Lin Manuel Miranda would be great. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, Lynn Mel- be Lynn, be, Lynn Manuel if, Miranda. Get the whole cast. I, I would actually like to see a Muppet version of Hamilton. In fact, that would be awesome. Well, this is something I saw on Facebook, but with the Great Gatsby now in the public domain, and I'm sure you've seen this too. There are people who are saying since they did Muppet Christmas Carol and Muppet Treasure Island, which are both in the public domain, yeah, and Muppet Wizard of Oz. Would you like to see a Muppet Great Gatsby ever? Sure. Okay. Well, Disney, Absolutely. if you're listening, make it happen. Absolutely. I mean, go for, go for it. I mean, they've they've shown they can adapt stuff. Very, I mean, that you know, play to their strengths. Rather than come up with an original Muppet movie, go ahead and adapt something. When I mean, people love Muppet Treasure Island, I mean, if you look at the scope post Jim, probably the two pieces that people love the most are Muppet Treasure Island and Muppet Christmas Carol. Well, for me, it's <laughs> Muppet are... Space because yeah. I was... Oh God, no, not Muppets for Space. Come on, it's I was awful. a few months old when that came out. <laughs> That's my childhood. <laughs> but so anyway, so like I said, the two most popular ones are adaptations of classic classic books. So it's yeah, so. I, it's... I, I don't think there's anything wrong with going to that well for them. 
Well, it's so funny with Muppets from Space because, sorry, not Muppets from Space, Muppet Treasure Island, because when I was 11 and we were doing our own little Muppet show, a lot of my friends and I, we were actually in a play. It was um, an adaptation of Treasure Island, and we used Muppet Treasure Island for inspiration. Like, we watched them before rehearsals. We watched them before getting ready. We watched them before getting to know what it was we were, what we were going to be doing, and I was Long John Silver. And um, I have uh, – it's so weird for me to watch that now because I've, <laughs> I've, my voice has deepened since then. I, I, becoming an adult sucks, but um, – <laughs> It really does. So uh, I remember Jerry Nelson was doing Blind Pew, and um, we actually had the star of the show was doing Jim Hawkins, was a, a girl, I think her name was Colby, and her younger brother was doing Pew. And so he actually said, I want to do it like the Muppet version. I was like, okay, well, this is the way, and I even coached him through because, you know, Jerry Nelson was one of my heroes. And so I said, well, this is the way he did it. Because uh, Cart, uh, Carter, I think was his name. He had said, have you seen my friend Billy Bones? Like that. And I was like, try gruffing your voice a little bit. So, have you seen my friend Billy Bones, my pet? Like how Jerry did it. And nobody knew who I was referring <laughs> to. Uh, but at that same time, we also were, um, uh, this is a little story for you. So we, our teacher, in my grade five teacher, we were learning about PowerPoint technology. And the assignment was do a PowerPoint on whatever it is you want. So I said, can I do mine on Jerry Nelson? My teacher's like, who is Jerry Nelson? Right. <laughs> That's what I ended up doing. I did a whole PowerPoint presentation on Jerry Nelson. Uh, I wish I wish I could have showed it to him. You know, another person would be great on a new Muppet show would be Bill Hader. Oh yeah, Bill. And, and he's a and he's a puppeteer. Oh, oh, you know, it would be an interesting uh, backstage plot. Bill Hader trying to do a puppet act on the Muppet show, but they're like, no, we don't allow puppet acts on here. Oh, that would be interesting. Like, remember the, the puppet routine he did on SNL? Where he had, like, the puppet that was, like, the PTSD oh, yeah, yeah. Vietnam fan. Yeah, I, 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 I don't watch I SNL that much. I was I don't I, either, but, like, that one, everyone sent that one to me because yeah, the puppets in it. Yeah, and actually, in the Treasure Island play that, um, that we did, the opening title was actually Shiver My, Shiver My Timbers, the opening number from Up at Treasure Island. And it was uh -huh. just all the actors coming into the gymnasium. Uh, it was a, you could fit our old, you could fit our old school in that gymnasium. And um, it, it was almost like as big as a museum. And um, it was just us coming in and just walking on stage and, putting all the props where they needed to be, picking them up and helping everyone out to shiver my timbers. And then we did um, sailing for uh, sailing for adventure. And I did a lot of, I, I'm a Jim Carrey kid as well. You know, the mask, Ace Ventura. Right. Here's and another, uh, here's another one that would be good on the Muppet show. Oh yeah. I can, I can see it. I can see it totally hundred uh, percent. And, and get Frank Oz back for that one. You know, they're masters in improv, Frank Oz and Jim Carrey. They'd get along great. Have have Frank Oz come back and do Sam Eagle picking on oh, Jim God. Carrey and have Sam, him come Sam, back Sam as Sam the Eagle asking if 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 it's uh, asking if something's cultural is just the, one of the best lines ever. Right, and uh, so I did a lot of ad lib. I, basically, I made our our school musical. I made it into a slapstick show, basically, and <laughs> I, you know everyone really enjoyed it. They said I stole the show, but. I feel really badly that I made that into a slapstick show and I just kind of messed up a lot of, well, not messed up, but changed a lot of lines just to kind of make it funny. That was a real attention seeker move. But, <laughs> uh, I feel, again, I regret it. But um, I remember uh, from the uh, Muppet Treasure Island when they were, when Long John Silver was bringing in the alcohol and everyone was enjoying it. And that's like, no, we're not going to allow drinking. Okay. And then we just dump it. That's what I did. I was pretending to pour it and the bottle was empty, but it was full of, I don't know what it was. It looked like apple cider. It's a good thing we had date. I wonder if you could make that joke nowadays, actually, too. I don't know. Well, a good point because we were in elementary school. I never yeah. thought of that, but um, yeah, basically I pretended to pour it and I had a cup and it's like, I'm sorry, I won't allow drinking. Okay, I just thought you, that it was for the crew. No, we're not going to allow alcohol. <laughs> so I pretended to throw it back. Um, so yeah, that uh, that was where the that was one of the moments where the Muppets definitely influenced me. Yeah, may, maybe I could be a guest on the Muppet Show doing what I did as an eleven-year-old, but older. 
and it would be so much fun. I mean, I loved looking at the, the you know, the pictures of them and, you know, just rehearsing for it and, and having the, you know, the guests up on the platforms so they, you know, where they can interact with them and people staring at the monitors and trying to figure out if jokes work and, you know, sending stuff to the floor at the last minute. I mean, it just must have been a crazy fun time for them to be making those. Oh, absolutely. 100%. I would, I would love to have actually been a fly on the wall. On the, I, I got as close as I could in the book, but uh, anyway, I had, I had a map of Elstree that I would refer to for everything, so I knew where everything was, and um, I had Bonnie describe to me the, you know, the workspace under the Bonnie steps. Bonnie Erickson. Bonnie Erickson. Yeah, okay. that's who I thought. Uh, you who, meant. who, who built the? She actually built the workshop. Like Jim brought her over and put her in charge of setting up the workshop there and in, in London, and so I had her describe that space for me. Um, just, I mean, again, it was, you know, getting back to the way we started this conversation, it was a chapter I really wanted to be sure that I got right, that I really want to make sure that it was a you are there moment, um, because it's such a pivotal part of Jim's story, but really, I mean, every, every person I talked to, it was, I mean, just absolutely loved it. Uh, and you know, Peter Harris, who just died, it was a director on the movie right. show. When I, I talked to him on the phone, because this is, this is back in the days when Skype was unreliable, we couldn't really talk. <laughs> So I talked to him on the phone and he just, every time he would answer a question, he'd always go, oh, the good old days, the good old days. I mean, it's like people just loved talking about working on the money. The, the good old days like you and I have been talking about. Exactly right. I mean, it was just, you know, he just adored all the time he had on the show. So it was, you know, it was really one of those chapters I wanted to be sure it came out right. I love it. I love it. So a big thank you to Brian J. Jones for chatting with me about The Muppet Show. Hopefully some of our favorite episodes or favorite moments from The Muppet Show are some of yours as well. Let us know if there's any that we might have missed. And all of the episodes that we were talking about, for the most part, are now streaming on Disney+, Plus, so you can check those out. If you haven't seen The Muppet Show, if you're a Muppet fan who would like to see The Muppet Show but but have never, if, you're, if your Muppet fandom is mostly just the latest stuff, or if you want to watch The Muppet Show again and you have seen it before, I highly recommend it. It's a great show. It, it's very Muppetational, I'll say. So that's it for me. Peace! <laughs>